This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Four minutes after ten is the time. We may move on a little later to the vexed and rather troubling question of why so much of the right-wing media this morning is trying to terrorise poppy sellers by uh, either exaggerating, embellishing or inventing alleged threats from people protesting against the carnage in Gaza. But we begin, in many ways, um, on the other end of that issue. I don't do this very often. I, 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 you know, I sit in the office upstairs with Eleanor, the producer, discussing what, what we're going to talk about on air. And, um, and it usually comes from the news. It usually comes from uh, the reports that we're looking at, either things that have been printed this morning or things that have broken overnight or... Um, uh, well, you know how the news works. You don't need me to tell you. But I also, um, decreasingly so, scroll through Twitter. I, I I scroll through social media. I'm trying to scroll through threads a bit more now, at Mr. James O'B, if you want to join me there. It's the same handle that I have on X, as I think they call it. And very, very occasionally, something completely stops me in my tracks. And it is often something that manages to crystallise something that I've wanted to talk about on the show, but haven't quite found the right way into it. Do, do you see what I mean? Uh, you, you, you know, I can just read out a headline and then say, ring me now. But if we do that, we won't get very interesting or nuanced or illuminating contributions because you, I, my job is to get your little grey cells working. Not every day. You know, some days we don't need any run-up at all, do we? We can just dive straight in and start thrashing around. But, but on really complicated, difficult poignant, sensitive issues, uh, you've got to get the question right. Uh, and it's why I'm not expecting any um, violins to be cracked out of their cases at the moment, but it's why on the uh, terror attack on Israel on October the 7th and the subsequent bombardment of Gaza, I, I work very hard to reflect reality as opposed to loyalty, as opposed to loyalty on some cases, in some cases, loyalty to one side that extends to the exclusion of concern for the other. So I work very hard to reflect reality. And something I've wanted to reflect for a while has been articulated quite perfectly by my friend, Professor Lucy Easthope, who is a disaster response expert and the author of a magnificent book called When the Dust Settles. And, and one of the most interesting thinkers I've met, she was on uh, Full Disclosure. She was my guest on Full Disclosure about six months ago. And, and some people you just sit in the presence of and absorb. You, you just learn and, and also get inspired. And I'm going to read you what she tweeted, word for word. Because as I say, it completely stopped me in my tracks. I think a lot about how many Jewish families were told they were overreacting between 1936 and 1939. She's referring, of course, to, to, to Germany, most obviously. And how much that must shape their descendants. We have to find more ways to properly acknowledge that fear in the UK right now. It, it, it touches, of course, upon the notion of both collective and intergenerational trauma, which I will stress is now something that will be very much in play on the Gaza Strip. The trauma of what is happening there will be both collective and intergenerational. It's why I personally find talk of eradicating Hamas optimistic, to say the very, very least. But I want to focus on this question today, and, and I'm going to do so, as ever, with my very best efforts to reflect reality, and, and the reality obviously involves the horror of what is currently unfolding in Gaza, as well as the horror of what unfolded on October the 7th. And I mentioned to you two days ago that I'd been speaking to, to quite a prominent Muslim, quite, quite, let's just say you know their name, who has, for the first time in their life, had a conversation with their partner about the possibility of, of packing up and going somewhere else, packing up and leaving, just a sense, particularly as a consequence of Suella Braverman's interventions, a sense that, that, you know, that caller we took on Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday, who said, Monday, I'll never be British enough as a, as a, as a 
British born and bred Muslim woman. She said, I'll never be British enough. And that is very much the environment that Suella Braverman seems to be committed to creating. So I, I, I'm aware of that. And I'm not going to take any accusations of both sidesism because there's only one side if you come at this from the humanitarian perspective, and that side is human. But I am going to focus today on the Jewish experience. And I'm going to ask you both to explain that notion of collective and intergenerational trauma, the role that the knowledge your forebears were told in the mid-1930s in, in Germany or Poland, but particularly, I imagine, Germany, you were told that you had nothing to worry about. What's the grocer called in Cabaret? It's not, not just a musical, of course, based on the short stories, the incredibly powerful short stories of Christopher Isherwood, but, but the grocer who was convinced everything was going to be all right, the Jewish grocer who was convinced everything was going to be all right, just as the, as the Nazis began to just, uh, just begin to lower their jackboot onto the windpipe of Jewish freedom in Germany. A lot of people thought, yeah, we'll be okay. And to be honest with you, if anyone had posited the Holocaust in 1936, you probably would have thought they'd gone bonkers, right? You just, no, come off it. They might make life a bit difficult for us. But then, <laughs> death camps, don't be stupid. Um, so question number one is, well, what is that? How does that intergenerational trauma work in your life? And, and specifically on the role of being told or, or or telling each other telling yourselves your, your your grandparents perhaps telling themselves that there was nothing to worry about or or that we were overreacting you're overreacting I, I'd, I'd love to get into that because we won't most of us have that background that history that knowledge but the other bit i think is something that everybody could perhaps answer although i suspect jewish people will be at the front of the queue how, how do we properly acknowledge that fear in the UK right now? Now, I'm going to put some conditions in place. It is, to me, not just permissible, but essential that people are able to protest peacefully against war. Okay? It is absolutely essential to me that people are able to protest peacefully against war. And whether you like it or not, the alternative is worse. Because next time, it might be a war that you disapprove of or it might be a war that you despise, but the rule is established. I, I'm, I'm not impressed, I have to be honest, by people trying to argue that the worst possible time to protest against war is upon the day that we commemorate the We celebrate, in many ways, the end of a war and we commemorate the end of a war. I think some of the Tory... Uh, uh, politicians and, and client journalists who are, who are arguing that Armistice Day is an inappropriate day upon which to call for an armistice are at the very best silly and at the very worst outrageous um, for fairly obvious reasons but also because the war in Gaza is happening now so the idea that you pause opposition to an actual unfolding war and humanitarian disaster because you're busy commemorating another war that ended 80 years ago seems to me to be strange. Let's just say strange. 12 minutes after 10 is the time. So how do we do that? How, how do we properly acknowledge the fear that Jewish people have when they see large congregations of protesters that could be construed as being opposed to the existence of Israel. Now, they're not, I'm afraid. That's not an opinion. That's counting. There's some people in those crowds who are. It's absolutely impossible for good or for ill to count or to break down what the um, motivation is. But it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter because if you were Jewish in Germany in the 1930s and you saw the Nazis marching up your street, you're not going to stop and ask each individual one of them how anti-Semitic they are or how they feel about the um, prospect of deportations and death camps. It, 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 it's a fear of a mass. It's a fear of an amorphous mass marching in, well, 
in support of people being bombed by the people you support. So it is not morally complicated to understand how that can transmogrify very quickly into a fear that they are marching against you. So how does that work? O three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. I'm not going to uh, deploy idiot's corner at this point, but I'll read one message out just to give you an indication of why I always go to some lengths to explain to you the thinking behind what I'm doing. Um, wow, you've certainly changed your tune from trying to justify these anti-Semitic marches previously to actually acknowledging that Jewish people will be afraid. Anyone using a brain cell would have known this. Clearly, you've been given a change in your script. So I'll pick up on that because I don't think it's going to be representative of many people with fully functioning cerebral cortexes, but, but there'll be a few. So what you've done there is make a bad situation worse. Because you've claimed that the marches are anti-Semitic, which they're obviously not, uh, any more so than an average gathering of any group of people is anti-Semitic because there are a few anti-Semites in the room. So you're, you're, you're trying to make a difficult situation worse, but you're not, unfortunately, capable of realising that at the moment. And you've also completely failed to understand the meaning of the words that I have said this morning because I have said that it is of passionate and paramount importance that people are always able and free to protest against war, to protest peacefully against war. So I am still justifying the peace protest. I'm still justifying the marches. But you are so curdled by your loyalties that you've managed to hear words that were not spoken. And that's very relevant, actually, to the broader conversation as well. Because some people will hear me say... I want to talk about the intergenerational trauma, the, the, the collective trauma of the Jewish experience with particular reference to the 1930s when families were told and persuaded each other that they were overreacting to the threat of the Nazis. And people just like our friend who sent this message will be cross with me for not talking about the people in Gaza. And they'll be cross with me for not focusing more heavily upon the deaths that are happening today. And you two are identical to each other. And I understand why, and, I, and I, I, I pity you. It's a horrible place to be, but a completely comprehensible one. Our job is to, is to, to stay in reality, to prioritise reality over loyalty. And anybody who thinks it is not a reflection of reality to say that Jewish people are frightened by these marches, regardless of whether that is a logical reaction or not, anybody who thinks that is not a reflection of reality, I'm afraid, is dangerously wrong. So let's talk about that fear. And let's talk about the ways that we can all properly acknowledge it. That's all. Properly acknowledge it. Not deny it. Not dismiss it. Not allow it to completely define policy or, or, or public response. Not allow it, sadly for many, to lead us to a place where we ban peaceful protests against war. How can we properly acknowledge it? It's 10.17. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 20 minutes after 10. And just in case you thought I was exaggerating with um, the first uh, entry into Idiot's Corner this morning uh, for accusing me of changing my tune when I've done nothing of the sort. And then I said there'll be someone also cross about the fact that I'm talking about the intergenerational trauma of Jews. And why aren't you talking about the intergenerational trauma of Palestinians? Here's Danny in Belfast saying you should also mention the generational trauma of Palestinian families who lost their homes in 1948. Many still have the keys of their houses. So I just mention that to keep Danny happy and to point out to you that however I conduct these conversations, someone will be cross. And if you're the person that's cross, maybe have a little think about why the person who passionately disagrees with you about everything is cross as well. Because there's no way you can both be right. But there is a way in which you can both be wrong. Jackson Edgeway. Jack, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, man. Um, so I'm uh, Jewish from, from London. My dad, uh, his parents kicked out of Poland and Romania. And then my mum, her parents were kicked out of Iraq and they had to go to Israel. So I've got family in Israel. Awesome. I went to a Jewish school um, in London. And what I wanted to say is that it is 
consistently and constantly drummed into us from pretty much the moment that we're born. Mm. And that's even in the stories from, from the Bible and stuff like that. It's not just about the Holocaust. It is about thousands and thousands of years, literally every single one of our, fe- well, not every single one, but most of the, our festivals are celebrating a time when we manage to escape genocide. Um, so the whole thing of, you know, us being told we're overreacting, I mean, I completely agree with you. I do feel like people are telling us that we're overreacting. Um, it's what, what but the, the, found... the point is, and, and listen, we're both grown up, so we can speak frankly. Yeah. You, you might be on this occasion. But the point about mm-hmm. historical, and, in, and, and it, it, in my view, I don't think there is an existential threat to Jews in this country by any stretch of the imagination. But, uh, but, but I'm not going to argue with you about how you feel, because how you feel is intrinsically linked to what we are talking about and, and it's, to it's, the it's thing you've just described like, as having been drummed into you, for, for, but drummed yeah. into Jewish people for millennia. For millennia. And I think, you know, what I would say to, I think it was Sam in Belfast, mm. is, you mm. know, obviously the, the the Palestinians, yeah, they, they have, I think it's been 75 years, you know, they, they have been oppressed and their homes been taken and stuff like that. But I think what people need to understand about Jews is that we've always been second class citizens. We've always been the, the minority. We've never actually been allowed, apart from in Israel, to be equal status you know mm. palestinians and their ancestors would have been first class citizens under the ottomans they would have in in an arab in in an arabic sort of uh region um, yes no I, I understand i mean it's why the you word I mean? it's why so the word ghetto that's... is in the is in the in the english language isn't it although i i, exactly. I mean it, it, on monday oddly when a muslim lady said to me that she felt feels this week that she will never be british enough in many ways that's something that a lot of jewish people would completely oh, could, exactly. understand isn't it yeah we 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 you know we 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 never totally feel safe just because of everything that we've heard has happened to our ancestors so and that you don't have to tre- even try to answer this because I don't know where I would start. But but how how do we better as a society, uh, or as a population, or even perhaps just as a media or a radio show? How do uh, how do we better acknowledge that fear? Um, it's very hard because when when I was growing up, I was told not not by the Jewish community by pretty much everyone in this country mm. if you sort of lean towards the left they're for freedom for liberty for you know all people that sort of thing and then what I've seen um, especially on October 8th um, where you know th- there was this this article in the guardian Yuval Noah Harari and I just want to read read out one sentence that mm. that I think really really pushes it. Uh, we, we never imagined the individuals on the left, advocates for equality, freedom, justice and welfare, would reveal such extreme moral insensitivity and political recklessness. And then he says, you know, in fact, every consistent leftist must hold both positions simultaneously, both positions being in, you know, complete condemnation of Hamas and what has happened, and also in complete condemnation of the Israeli government and what has happened and what is is, is happening. And what I saw on October 8th in terms of my friends from university, people on on, on social media and Mm. stuff like that, is that they were cheering for it. Like, that's what I saw. I've lost friends. Because so of cheering this, for the terror cheering. attack, cheering for the October well, seven terror attack. So, 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 I, not necessarily cheering for. But it, that's what but, you felt they um, were doing. Explaining it, explaining it away. Oh, the reason why this has happened is because of the Israeli government. Because it, it's of terrible, this. but it's terrible, but and yeah. you know, I've I've tried very very hard, especially when I went to uni and stuff like that, and having conversations with people, to not always, you know. The, the what about ism, if you know what I mean. Oh, but yes. what about the Israelis? What about the Jews? You know, I've really tried my best. But that cuts, as people... you know, as well. And it's, it's it's beholden on me to point this out. But, but it cuts the other way as well, Jack. So, you know, yeah. you can't... Uh, an awful lot of people who want to protest on the streets of London this weekend are being told, but what about the October the 7th terror attacks? But what about condemning Hamas? So, you, 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 I mean, I see it's such a tragic reflection in those two positions, <laughs> they look much more similar to each other than they do to somebody observing fr- from the outside. Uh, the whataboutery runs through these arguments like 
Blackpool through a stick of rock. Exactly. So stop doing the what aboutery and stop doing the butts. Really, yeah, that would that would acknowledge, help. Acknowledge. Yeah. And I'm saying this to Jews as well. The Palestinians have it bad. Yeah. And acknowledge. I'm saying this to people who support Palestinians and Palestinians themselves. The Jews also kind of have it bad. Maybe not in Israel, but everywhere else and throughout history, we've also had it pretty bad. And that's the that's beautifully put, actually, Jack. I found that really unexpectedly quite moving. The idea of holding two not conflicting thoughts in your head at the same time because they're not conflicting, are they? But the um, but the but many people find it very hard to do that to to to, to yeah, just look beyond not mutually exclusive. They're not. That's the, gosh, you should be presenting this show. I should be ringing in. <laughs> they're absolutely not mutually exclusive, and yet it does so often feel that way, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It really does. Yeah. Jack, thank you, and take care. It's ten twenty-seven. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I don't know how many of these I'll read out. I'll read out one more just because um, it's important to be aware of the sort of febrile and, and dangerous and often very unthinking nature that the debate can adopt if you're not lucky enough to have people like Jack contributing to it. So this is from Simon, who's in Hertfordshire. You are typical of the... James, me. You are typical of the far left, as per Jeremy Corbyn, in being an anti-Semite, having thousands of Hamas supporters rampaging around central London on Remembrance Sunday or the preceding Saturday is, um, capital letters, out of order. The UK is not involved in Gaza. Remember, and Sunday is about our own servicemen and conflicts that cost hundreds of thousands of British lives. You are wrong yet again. Have respect. If they go ahead, the Muslims will be even more disconnected from British values than they already are. And Simon there deploying precisely the sort of language that the Nazis used about the Jews, but sadly being too stupid to understand how dangerous that is. But that's OK because I'm here to point it out. Joshua is in Boreham Wood. Joshua, what would you like to say? Um, hi, thanks, uh, thanks, James, for having me on. Um, I uh, was attacked, an anti-Semitic attack, um, August last year. Um, I was walking along, someone shouted anti-Semitic abuse. When I confronted them, two of them punched me. Um, the, the police response and investigation into it was so poor that despite the suspects being identified, the CPS said that the investigation wasn't good enough to be able to bring charges. So my feeling at the moment, yeah. with the increase in anti-Semitism, and despite the government, who I have many problems with, the, the, the words coming out of the government at the moment against anti-Semitism and in support of a Jewish community could not be stronger. Yet I have no faith in the police to be able to keep the Jewish community safe. So you're, 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 um, you're comfortable with tens of thousands of people who want only peace, and we've spoken to many of them on the programme this week, being labelled as hate marchers. I, I, I think, I, I'm saying that, that, that I'm not referring to those comments. Oh, forgive However, me. The, forgive issue, me. the issue, I, I think the comments I'm talking about is the fact that in the week after October the 7th, the Prime Minister addressed a prayer service of 2,000 Jews. Yes. The Deputy Prime Minister went to, I think, three different synagogues in one evening just to show the support to the Jewish community yes. and every time the, the, the voices against anti-Semitism. The, my problem with the marches, and this is a real genuine, genuine fear, of course. it may be that there's 100,000 people peacefully marching. There's 50 people there who are calling for blood. Mm. who are rabid anti-Semites, and it only takes one of them to, to, to attack someone. And, uh, and I, I that's obviously in, I, I true. Wouldn't... That's obviously true. Uh, but it's also true of every single march, whether you're talk, protesting against the poll tax or fox hunting. You, you say that. There have, been, uh, there have been weekly vigils of the Jewish community calling for the hostages to be freed, mm. and there's been no arrests, and there's been no suggestions of, of, of it. Well, I know, but um, there weren't 100,000 people at them, were there? Uh, up ten thousand on the first week. Yeah, there was no, there was no violence. There were very different. So some markets. of the well, I, again, I, I, I don't. I thought Jack's point about what aboutery was very important. Yeah. I, I'm going to be the what aboutery police today. <laughs> but, but um, you know, a, a, a march through the streets of London, at least two of the arrests out of I think only a total of nine were made by people attacking the people who were actually marching. So I don't, I don't. Okay, um, I wasn't, I wasn't aware. I no, that's fine. That's what I'm here for. And there were many, many more arrests at the Countryside Alliance march, which was essentially a post of fox hunting. So there's nothing specific to the nature of the people marching in support of Palestine that at the moment lends itself to violence. 
But the, the worry is, I, yes. I don't feel safe. And that's and a I'm real not, worry. I work, in, I work in central London. I've been working from home for the last month because I don't feel safe going on the train into London. I'm, I'm visibly Jewish. I wear a kippah. Yeah. And I'm scared to go in. And, and that's, the, that's the reality. Whether that's, whether that's a genuine one... Whether doesn't matter, does it? Like you, Thank yeah. you for saying that. That's because like that, that's right. that's the crux of it, isn't it? Whether it is genuine, whether if we could somehow punch all of the available evidence and statistics through an algorithm and it would tell me whether I have anything to be frightened of or not is completely irrelevant. But I, I, and again, I, I, you know, being attacked long before. October the 7th, being a victim of an anti-Semitic terror attack long before o o October the 7th, as you were, is also a complicating issue. Because and, it, and it, it, your fear is not Jewish born community. entirely of the October, obviously not born entirely of the current, the very current climate. But as a Jewish community, in, in recent history, we've got that. So when there were people... Yes. When there were people driving down Finchley Road in Jewish areas with megaphones calling anti-Semitic chants, the CPS didn't charge anyone. When there was someone punching Jews at random in Stamford Hill, yes. it, needed, it needed a massive campaign for the police, to CPS to say, oh, actually, this should be racially aggravated. Well, I mean, racially aggravated is, 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 is sometimes in the eye of the police, the uniformed beholder, and you're quite right to point that stuff out. Part of the problem there, and we're late for the news, is... Is precedent, isn't it? It's 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 yeah. knowing the difference between a, a a racially aggravated attack and another form of attack. Joshua, thank you. I did, this is obviously a, not an easy, and nor should it be an easy or a straightforward or a simple conversation. But I just I would stress I do understand why people want it to be easy and simplistic and straightforward because the alternative is complicated and confusing and difficult. And I am not by dint of what but but by dint of context. I am going to tell you of a of a story involving a completely different. Uh, set of circumstances that unfolded this week and I'm just going to ask you how widely reported you think it was and that is a story with the following headline a man has been found guilty of attempted murder after setting two elderly worshippers on fire outside mosques in London and Birmingham that, that verdict dropped this week and I just wonder how much prominence it has received in the media feed that reaches your eyes and ears it's 10.33 and Thomas Watts has your headline. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.37 is the time. This is, this is from a friend of mine. I, I, I'm not sure whether or not well, she hasn't said whether I can name her or not, so I won't. I'll just read it to you. I still find it too difficult to call in and talk to you about this on air, but I wanted to share my experience of intergenerational trauma that is subconscious. I sleep talk and sometimes walk on most nights since October the 7th, waking up my non-Jewish Irish partner, urging him to help me rescue my family in Israel, telling him they are currently hiding in the attic from Hamas. I don't have any recollection of any of this in the morning, only the nightmares themselves. What is particularly telling is that my parents and siblings all live in flats. They don't even have attics. But my Polish and Romanian Holocaust surviving grandparents did. I went to many pro-Palestine protests in the past. I absolutely support the right of people to protest this weekend and every weekend, and I am disgusted by Suella Braverman's rhetoric. But I don't feel like I can join this time, although I am horrified and heartbroken about what is happening in Gaza. I think it's just too raw, and I worry that some of the comments that I found devastating in the aftermath of the attack might be shared, or... Uh, or of the reported chance of intifada, which literally means resistance in Arabic, but also represents the wave of terror attacks that took place as I was growing up. Thank you. That is quite beautifully put and cuts to the very heart of the conversation that we're having today, which is how society, the media, this radio program, this man can better acknowledge that intergenerational trauma and fear that spins back centuries but particularly resonates with memories of people like my friend's grandparents being told in the 1930s that they were, that they were overreacting and not, not being told by Nazis necessarily that they were overreacting, but being told by each other. It's Herr Schultz in the uh, Candor and Webb musical Cabaret, but it's based upon Christopher Isherwood's uh, uh, stories, which he was writing, of course, um, living in, in Germany, living in Berlin in the 30s, in that uh, astonishing sort of subculture of, 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 of clubs and, um, 
a, a partying. Well, Peter Cook, I think it was, who, who always said, didn't they do a cracking job? All of the satirists and performers and artists in 1930s Germany did such a brilliant job of uh, making sure the Nazis never got anywhere. You probably need to be Peter Cook to deliver that line as, as brilliantly and as powerfully as, uh, as he did. Um, 10.40 is the time. Danielle's in Finchley. Danielle, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. First time caller, so Welcome. I'm a bit nervous. It's only me. Um, I, <laughs> I wanted to call because um, I'm a modern Orthodox Jew. I work at a Jewish secondary school. I've got my children in Jewish primary schools, and my husband wears a visible sign of Judaism. He wears a yarmulke, yeah. a kippah. And um, I, d I don't know if you've quoted this yet, but the CST, the Jewish Community Security Trust, who's responsible for the Jewish community security, has cited that anti-Semitic attacks since um, October have gone up 300%. So what we are experiencing and feeling is very much threat. Um, the tweet that you read out earlier kind of related it to 1930s Germany. And it might seem hyperbolic to some, but that is really how we are feeling. My husband and I have, to have, we have been having discussions as to if we have a future in this country. And that isn't to say that the whole of society doesn't value Jews or, the, or, the, or that anti-Semitism is embedded within it. But for the very first time, I've grown up here, I'm very much a British Jew. I've been shocked, and maybe I've been naive, at the way in which I feel that I'm being judged as a Jew mm. and that the actions of what's happening in Israel mean... But as a Jew, I'm wrong. This is and the conflation, isn't it? The classic conflation yeah. of Jewishness with absolutely full-throated support for anything that Likud or the IDF or, 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 or the Israeli state does, the Israeli government does. Yeah, and and I should say, you you refer to them as peaceful protests, peaceful marches. And no, I, I refer agree to you, the massive majority of them as peaceful okay, protests. Yeah. So... Unfortunately, that minority who are shouting jihad from the river to the sea in Tafada on tubes, on tube carriages. That, that I, creates the, the atmosphere yeah. of terror. And, and, it, and it is terror. And if you, ever, if you ever would observe or attend the, march, the marches in support of Israel by Jewish people, that is a peaceful protest. Mm. We're not inciting hatred. We just want the hostages back. Yes, so, but again, I, I don't know if what aboutery is the right word to use. The the, I mean, the pe the protests in solidarity with Palestinian people are in the context of hundreds, if not thousands, of people being killed every day. So they're, yeah, they're, not, not, they're not they're not they're not you're not we're not really comparing apples with apples. A, a, a vigil for hostages is unlikely to get very passionate. Whereas. Whereas a, well, a call well, for I, people... Sorry, to, I disagree with that. Well, I, okay. Why should You're a welcome vigil to. for hostages not get passionate? Um, as, in, as in violent or as in um, over-emotional. I think it's a time of contemplation, prayer and peacefulness, isn't it? Yes, but it is full of emotion and passion. We no, just of course, don't I, 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 No, I've, of course. I, 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 I sort of qualify my use of the word passion and turn it instead into, into peacefulness, contemplation and prayer. Whereas a protest calling for people to stop killing children is much more likely to provoke very different feelings and responses. I think that's a reasonable observation, Daniel. Well, I think they kind of both concern children. So I think there are emotions high in both, in both situations. Yes, of, of course. But, uh, but and, the and difference I, between I, a vigil and a... Peace march is is pretty acute, and and I, and I do think it's important not to conflate. In the same way, it's very important not to conflate every Jew with a with a sort of blind supporter of Benjamin Netanyahu. So I don't think that a comparison between a a, a a a a vigil for hostages being held and in many ways abandoned by the Israeli government is is the same any more than I would compare a vigil for hostages with a with a march against you know fox hunting or, or poll tax rights. They're just completely different creatures, Daniel. Okay, well, if we move away from the distinction between the marches and the vigils, and we just focus on the experience of being a Jewish person today, yes, I just really want people to understand that it is very frightening. And, for example, at the school that I work at, our security has been heightened. We're having evacuation procedures yeah. where we practice for some sort of terrorist attack, which we've always had, I hasten to add, but they've obviously been up. Um, and the level of fear that teenagers are feeling going 
to and from school wearing their kippot, wearing their blazer, and or I not, really, or not wearing their blazer not. because exactly. they're because they're too frightened. So how do we address that then? Which my friend Lucy described as acknowledging the fear. How do we better acknowledge the fear? As in, how do we improve? As how in, do we make people, people safe in the country? Or well, just recognizing the reality of what you describe if you are someone who is not actually feeling it yourself because of a, your background because of a different background how do we well, better acknowledge it i suppose to use the language of the era danielle and i'm no teenager but what would make you feel more seen i have to be honest with you first of all there are a lot of excellent journalists who are writing about this mm. and from what from what my community feels in recent weeks We've come together as a community because I don't think if you're not experiencing this, you can understand if you're not part of this community. So we've tightened our bonds as a community. Yes. And we, like, and we will, of course, keep putting up photos of the hostages that we want to get back, keep holding peaceful vigils. But I'm not calling because I want the world to wake up because the world knows. I'm just telling you that it's very much here, but we're lucky that we have a community that we can hold and strengthen each other. Yes. And again, I, 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 remind, I have to remind you of this because I think it is a, such a poignant observation that the, 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 the lady who rang me on Monday to talk about not feeling safe here anymore was a Muslim. And the phrase she used was, mm. I don't think I'll ever be British enough. And, and I think that's something that only your two communities, perhaps. Definitely. Well, anybody of colour as well, of course, depending on who they're dealing with. But that's the thing I don't know, Daniel. That's the bit that makes me want to weep is that it just feels... That commonality between two communities who will feel they will never be British enough just makes me feel that the, the, the very naively, very, very naively and idealistically that the some form of, of, of resolution or solution must be within reach. And then, of course, you look at the fact of history and realise that if it is, then uh, it's certainly not within easy reach. Danielle, thank you. Uh, 10.47 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. New texts, because they set context, often from people who, uh, let's just say, lack the inclination to ring in rather than the courage. Um, and one of them is very complimentary. I'll warn you in advance in case you want to go and make a cup of tea, but I think, I, I think I've earned it. But before that, one from Fran, who says, I come from a Huguenot family. There is absolutely no way that I am in any danger at all. But something has remained in family stories passed down. I'm not sure what it is, James. A sadness, perhaps. I can't wait that the Huguenots, of course, fled France for due to religious persecution, made their way to this country where they were. I'm just showing off my knowledge of history now. It's pathetic, isn't it? I was about to say where they mostly worked in the lace industry. How is that helpful to the conversation in any way, shape or form? Beautifully put, though, Fran. I cannot understand, she adds, how Jewish people feel. I cannot understand how Palestinians feel. But anyone who sees a person as part of humanity and precious can see both sides of this terrible moment. Um, a couple of texts just uh, detailing my tightrope now. The first one, James, you had an innately moral and unashamedly unbiased view of the Palestinian plight and in general of any civil oppression. Have the media powers that be elbowed you in the ribs? Another person suggesting that I must be um, operating under orders today to express sympathy and solidarity with the Jewish experience. Uh, but it doesn't work with everybody because in the same minute, literally at 10.42, this also came into the studio. Disgraceful again from James, again trying to explain away the huge anti-Jew section of the recent protests. He is a disgrace. So... You make of that what you will. And that's why I'm going to let myself read out a nice one. James, you have conducted many good conversations over the years, but I t today I feel like you have hit some sort of jackpot and are guiding the conversation perfectly. The callers so far, especially the first young man, have been great. And I hope that everyone on all sides, regardless of whatever disagreements they have, could reflect and learn from them, your callers. Thank you for your great work. You are like a hard graft builder, constantly patching up while the government runs around the block with a hammer, creating division. Thank you. That one got me, actually. It really did. 10.53 is the time. Robert is in Maida Vale. Robert, what would you like to say? Oh, hello, James. Hello. Very interesting discussion today, actually. Um, yes, so, I uh, hope so. It, it created a situation where I had to pull over the car and ring, ring through. But um, nice. um, I think the, the nervousness amongst the Jewish community, there, of course, there is... It's, 
it does down, down to, to history about where, yeah. how we were brought up, going into the, um, the Bible and the Torah from when we were brought up with mm. our, many of our festivals. Um, but um, I think that the, the reality is, is, is that, I mean, for example, most of the Jews in this country um, are here because they fled persecution. They came from, whether it's um, Arab countries where they were persecuted, they came from Europe, where they came from Poland and yeah. Russia, where they're escaping pogroms, etc. I think it's so the 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht today, actually, Robert, which is very pertinent and poignant, isn't it? It's very poignant, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the nervousness, I think, as well, is, I mean, to give you an idea, my father was, in, um, was felt very British, um, 85th, he, he, forgive me, he, he, 85th. My, we proved yesterday my maths is awful. Carry on, tell me about your okay, father. Okay, fair <laughs> so my father, my father was um, in the RAF, and his surname was, it was a Jewish surname. He had numerous comments and, and various attacks to, on him, and not, not physical attacks, but certainly mm. verbal attacks when he was in the RAF. When he came out, he specifically changed his, his, his surname to, so that it, it, he didn't fit, fit into the, <coughs> excuse me, the... Um, the Jewish narrative, if you like, yes, um, because he wanted to be British so much. Um, then my my wife's um, uh, mother was on the Kinderporter. Gosh. They fled um, from Germany. They were on the part, so and they fled up to North, and they were looked after by uh, an English family um, for for a, a few years. They didn't know whether they'd see their parents again. So, in many ways, the, the Jewish people in this country are always looking um, behind their back. To make sure that they're safe, yes. um, and there is a, there is definitely these marches to a certain extent um, that are going on at the present time. We feel as a community that there is a certain amount of hypocrisy, or in fact, actually not even a certain amount, a lot of hypocrisy coming from, sadly, the many of the Muslim communities, but certainly amongst the left in this country, people like um, Stop the War organisations, etc. Mm. Because we feel next door in Syria. As you know, that in many ways there's still a civil war there. There was half a million Muslims murdered by President Assad and the, and, and the Syrians next door. There wasn't one protest amongst the Muslim community. Is, um, just in, just in, in, persuade me that this isn't what about her? No, no, I promise you, no, it's not. I, I, this, I'm, my viewpoint is is that absolutely, if people want to go and protest on the street. There has to be a right to the, for them to do so. Mm. I do feel that there's, there's a bit of a sensitivity this weekend. That's my personal feeling. Yes, okay. But they have the absolute right to do so. But I genuinely feel, and many of the community do so, it's, it's, it's because, and there's never been a, the Stop the War organization have never put a, a um, for example, a, a march um, regarding the Ukraine-Russia war. There's mm. never been this. And that's how we, that you can understand. I'm not sure that last bit is true, but I, I, I just want to, if I can, precy the thrust of what you're saying in case anybody doesn't understand, because I think it's pretty hard to argue with. You're talking about, and, and you, you choose to describe them as Muslims, which is fine. There'll be plenty of people on the march who are not Muslim or religious, or, and no, no, there'll be plenty I, of Jewish I, people there as well. But here is the point. When, a, when Israel kills thousands of Muslims in Gaza, there is an enormous march on the street. When... Uh, Assad kills thousands of Muslims in Syria. There is not. That's that's the double standard that you're describing. Absolutely, and it's not even. And you know, you can look at throughout the world. You can look at the Muslims that were killed in in Myanmar. You can the look Uyghurs. at Muslims. But isn't the problem exactly here? You can also look at the um, the ones that um, uh, in Yemen, the proxy yes. war between Iran and, and and Saudi Arabia. A quarter of a million Muslims have been killed in that war. But isn't uh, so, isn't 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 the problem here the the, or rather the difference here is that the people being killed in Gaza essentially are, are, are being killed because they are Palestinian, not because they're an enemy of, of the state in Syria or because they're trying to overthrow the regime. They're, they're, the civilians being killed in Gaza are being killed because they are Palestinian people. And I'd compound that also with an observation that Israel rightly expects to be a... Uh, a, an equal partner at the diplomatic and international tables. They're not a pariah state. They don't. Uh, they are not led, rightly or wrongly, by a man internationally regarded as a war criminal. So I, I, again, I, I think the comparison is pertinent up to the point that we've reached, but it's not quite as sweeping as perhaps you believe, Robert. 
Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, uh, there is a, a, a point to, to to that as well. I, I just, I'm just trying to reflect the nervousness yes, exactly. that's going among, which you asked this morning yes, and, and uh, at the beginning of your show, uh, what is going on in, 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 within the Jewish community. You know, as I said before, so many of us and our, our great our grandparents and our great grandparents came here. The yeah. British government allowed us to come here uh, on the basis, and, and we because they you were will be safe. running away. They were running away from exactly the sort of feedback and the, the venom that was is, that can be reflected. I'm not saying entirely all of them because that's completely wrong. Uh, within the within the streets at the moment, where you have got students and also students being attacked at universities because for one reason they're Jewish. Yes, and and, and I mean that's why it's absolutely pointless to pretend that the, that the fear is neither real nor justified. I'll, I'll end where we began, if I may, which is with the question of how this fear, how you think this fear could be better acknowledged okay. by society. How, what would you like to see happen? Um, I think there are some... some um, are you talking about specifically about Israel or just general? I'm talking about the, the, the fear you've described, the intergenerational fear, the, 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 the um, collective fear, the, the I, fear I you I feel think... as a consequence of your people's history, if that's a, an acceptable phrase I to I use. How do, how, like... do, how do the rest of us better acknowledge it? I, I think to understand, as we've been, talked about this morning, the, the history of... Uh, the Jewish people, not only going back into, mm. the, Bi- into the Bible, but also re- reflecting on um, what happened within the 19th century between sort of the pogroms and, and the 18th and 19th century, the pogroms in, in Russia and Poland. And I mean, there's, there has been issues here as well. But the reality is, is that the Jewish community in general felt safe here. We're, we've been integrated in society extremely well. And I think people need to perhaps reflect on that and, and understand put. a little bit of the history. That's nicely put. And I will uh, spare myself any furious text, any more furious text, by adding to Robert's very sober analysis that it's also quite a good idea to look into precisely what happened in, in, in 1948 in, in, when the um, modern state of Israel was, a, was effectively founded and when I think some 700,000 people that were living on that land previously were were moved because that is it's impossible to understand the bigger picture without looking at that as well but i'm going to end this hour with a reference to something that i cite in 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 my new book because uh, even as i wrote it i was and i'd seen it before but even as i wrote it i was thinking ah crikey this country man it's one of the reasons why the book's called how they broke britain this is a, a a report from 1938 in your favorite newspaper the Daily Mail, owned at the time by a man who sent love letters to Adolf Hitler and whose grandson, the current owner of the newspaper, oversaw Paul Dacre describing Ed Miliband, whose father was on the beaches at D-Day. His dead father was described as the man who hated Britain. It's the perfect distillation in in the book of the role that right-wing media has played in polluting and corrupting our entire society. And here is what they wrote in the Daily Mail in 1938. The way stateless Jews from Germany are pouring in from every port of this country is becoming an outrage. I intend to enforce the law to the fullest. In these words, Mr. Herbert Metcalf, the Old Street Magistrate, yesterday referred to the number of aliens entering this country through the back door, a problem to which the Daily Mail has repeatedly pointed. So intergenerational trauma <laughs> has rarely been better described or, or justified than in that simple article from the... Um, same year of Kristallnacht. Just a little later that year, Nazi leaders unleashed a series of pogroms against the Jewish population in Germany and recently incorporated territories, later becoming known as Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, because of all the shattered windows that littered the streets after the vandalism and destruction of Jewish-owned businesses, synagogues, and homes. And if that doesn't bring home intergenerational trauma, then I've failed. James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. Six minutes after 11 is the time. Um, I, I, I don't know why, but I was thinking about Captain Tom this morning. I, I, I was thinking that if anybody at the time had even the vaguest inkling of how, um, how that saga would unfold after his sad death, then they would have stayed very, very silent about it. You, you know, we, we get caught up, don't we, in a strange combination of, of indignation and apparent pride when it comes to, in his case, war veterans. And in the case of the conversation that's happening in some corners of the British media today, poppies. Um, I, 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 just, as, just as a sort of little aside, as an intellectual exercise, if I wore four poppies... And you came up to me and said, why aren't you wearing four? Why, why, are, why are you wearing four poppies? And, and I would turn back to you and say, why aren't you, you traitor? You would think that was absolutely ridiculous, right? You'd think that was absolutely absurd. And yet some people can be led by the nose into positions of apparent uh, outrage by either imagined or hugely exaggerated events. The front page of The Sun today asks, where have all the poppies gone? Which is fine. You know, the, the uh, generation that has dedicated itself to selling poppies over the years is, is dying out. And the younger generation seem to be rather less motivated. I'll tell you who's really less motivated to go out and volunteer to sell poppies. The people writing articles and shouting about how hard it is to buy a poppy at the moment. There's nothing to stop them spending a few hours this afternoon on a stall at Charing Cross Station, is there? In fact, I, I, I'm, I'm sure they will. But it's not so much the where have all the poppies gone rhetoric, which we'll discuss a bit now. It's also no sellers at stations amid fears of attack. And this follows an article in the Daily Mail, which I read yesterday or the day before. And that's when I sort of found myself thinking about Captain Tom, because I read that article about a, a military veteran um, uh, d describing being attacked at Waverley Station in Edinburgh and, and claiming that people gathering there to protest against the bombing of Gaza were shouting about Jews and things like that. And I couldn't quite work out why the Daily Mail had used the language it used and so many quotation marks said he was attacked, claimed, alleged. It was written in a way that suggested lawyers had been over that article with the finest of tooth combs. It was written as if the Daily Mail were expecting the account of the gentleman concerned to be robustly challenged by later events. But I couldn't say that at the time because it would have been a little bit like saying, Captain Tom's family look a bit dodgy, don't they? I hope the old fella is, uh, I hope the old fella's not being exploited. If you'd said that at the time, you'd have been lynched, metaphorically speaking. But it wouldn't have mattered, would it? Because by the time the truth emerged, and I think yesterday the family discovered that they're going to have to tear down the spa that they built um, with, uh, without planning permission. If you'd said that at the time, you, you would have been lynched, wrongly and incorrectly, but life's too short sometimes to take on a baying mob of people who are determined to accuse you of all manner of sins. So I, I read that article and I, I, I mean, if this was a court of law, I could prove it with conversations that I had with other people. And I just thought it's been written in a very strange way. It's been written in a way that suggests to me the Daily Mail is expecting this version of events to be very robustly challenged by reality. And they want to be able to say, subsequently, we only ever reported what we were told by the gentleman concerned. We did not. We put everything in quotes. But by today, people have removed the quotes. And they're even talking to government ministers, to the Transport Secretary Mark Harper, as if there was a terrible offence involving a poppy seller at Waverley Station in Edinburgh. And a lot of people conducting this conversation appear to have missed or perhaps deliberately and disgracefully ignored a statement from the British Transport Police, which was issued 15 hours ago. And the statement says, um, two separate offences were reported to British Transport Police in relation to an incident at Edinburgh Waverley Station on Saturday the 4th of November. The first incident reported to us was a racially aggravated public order offence, which is not linked to the protest at the station. Detectives have arrested a 41-year-old man from Airdrie, North Lanarkshire, in connection with this incident. He is currently in police custody. 
The second is a reported assault on a poppy stall seller whilst the demonstration was taking place at the station. Detectives have extensively monitored CCTV and spoken with key identified witnesses. There is insufficient evidence to take the investigation further at this time. Now, crucially, in quotes from the Assistant Chief Constable of the British Transport Police, we have no reason to believe that poppy sellers are at any risk of being intentionally targeted. Right? Intentionally is pertinent there, because if you are selling poppies in an enclosed space, like a railway station concourse, and you are elderly and perhaps a little fragile, and an enormous crowd of people appears you are probably going to feel a little bit wary, a little bit nervous, especially if they're loud and waving flags. But no risk of being intentionally targeted is absolutely crucial. Because I have listened today and read today people trying to terrorise poppy sellers into being frightened. People very deliberately either claiming or pretending to believe that people protesting against the continued bombing of people in Gaza, are targeting poppy sellers. The Sun, no sellers at stations amid fears of attack. Now, we must ask ourselves, where are these fears of attack? If they are true, where are they coming from? Because they're not coming from Palestinian protesters who have, as far as the police have established, and remember that Railway stations in this country will be a most, among the most surveilled spaces on the planet. The amount of cameras that are in place at railway stations make the average television studio look amateurish. And a lot of the footage has actually been made available, whether it's the official CCTV footage or footage filmed by people at the station. So there is... Currently, absolutely no evidence of any attack whatsoever anywhere. Some sellers at Liverpool Street Station were discombobulated by an enormous crowd, as indeed they would have been had five conflicting football uh, supporting football team supporters convened upon a railway station at the same time. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It happened to me at Euston about three months ago. And it's a, it's a discombobulating, possibly even quite a frightening experience uh, just to be caught up in a, in a man. Of course, all the chanting and the shouting, uh, especially when they start shouting at each other. And I don't know what British Transport Police does to ensure that away fans coming into London, if there's home games at five or six different London clubs, try and keep all the fans apart. But that, if I was there selling biscuits, I, I, I would be discombobulated when the massive crowd arrived. So I'm not pretending for a minute that the poppy sellers at Liverpool Street Station were not discombobulated by the enormous crowd turning up, not to shout about football, but to shout about the unfolding massacre in Palestine. So where do the fears of attack come from? Who is creating the fear of attack that the sun claims many poppy sellers feel? The answer, sadly, is the sun and the Daily Mail and some of their uh, fellow travellers in the broadcast media. So why is right-wing media terrorising and terrifying poppy sellers? Actually, let me rephrase that slightly because I don't think it's working. The question becomes, why is right-wing media trying to terrify poppy sellers? It's not a question I've asked you before and it's not a question I ever thought I would because it speaks of a country that is absolutely crackers. Absolutely crackers. British Transport Police literally release... In response to claims that a poppy seller was attacked at Edinburgh Station, they release a statement that concludes, we have no reason to believe that poppy sellers are at any risk or being intentionally targeted. Daily Mail and The Sun telling their readers every day this week that if you're a poppy seller, you, 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 you might as well be uh, running down a sniper's alley in the middle of Gulf War, Gulf War Baghdad. And it's, it's, it's not right. I think that's going to become my new catchphrase. It's not right to do this. It's, I mean, however desperate you are to sell papers or um, get some clicks by inflaming the public, you shouldn't be using the poppy to do this. You should not be using the poppy to pursue your own political or petty vendettas against an unidentified foe. In this case, people protesting or calling for a ceasefire, calling for peace in Gaza. 
So that is the question. Why is the right-wing media trying to terrify poppy sellers? That's it. That's the question. You can bring in as much as you want on this. You can come at it from whatever angle you please. You can't really argue with the central thesis. It seems like such an unpatriotic and unhelpful thing to do. And yet, bizarrely, these are the people who are normally announcing in very loud voices how patriotic they are, and how much they care about military veterans. Um, except, of course, when Suella Braverman is suggesting that the charities that give them tents, if they're unfortunate enough to end up homeless, should be fined. Then quite a lot of these right-wing commentators just go quiet, in the same way that they do when they're slagging off refugees by saying we should look after our own, and then bizarrely, when it's time to look after our own, by making sure that families can afford to feed their children or wash themselves, they start expressing deep, deep and profound scepticism about the existence of poverty in this country, so they put themselves in the wonderful position where they say, we shouldn't look after foreigners, we should look after our own, but actually... Very luckily, none of our own actually need to be looked after. Vote Conservative. There it is. That's it. That's the nutshell. But this one's even uglier than usual, isn't it? This one's even uglier than usual. Why is right-wing media trying to terrify poppy sellers? 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 21 minutes after 11, and it's a fairly grim question that uh, is prompted by some very excitable journalism, if we can use that word, uh, notably on the front of The Sun this morning, where it says that, where have all the poppies gone? Busy rail stations have been left without poppy sellers amid fears of more pro-Palestine protests. No sellers at stations amid fears of attack, and yet there have been, it would seem, no attacks, despite reports in the Daily Mail earlier this week, cloaked in quotation marks um, involving a, a, a gentleman selling poppies in Edinburgh wearing a, what I think is a parachute regiment beret, uh, insisting that he'd been attacked. Um, the footage has been examined by the police and some of it uh, filmed by CCTV, by uh, eyewitnesses, by people present. The footage tells a slightly different story, perhaps, which has led Assistant Chief Constable Sean O'Callaghan to conclude we have no reason to believe that poppy sellers are at any risk or being intentionally targeted. So why are all your favourite right-wing blowhards telling you that poppy sellers are being targeted? Why? Tony's in Greenock. Tony, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Thanks for taking the call. Um, I, I think that the, the poppy has long since been a, made to be a, a symbol of what political... Um, how your political thinking is, um, you know, if, if you wear a poppy, you, you, you're you're pro-British. You're you're you know, it's a very jingoistic thing. If you're not wearing a poppy, you're you're anti-British. You're you're you know. It, it does not, feel. You, I you mean, that, yes, that, that, that's why I used the joke at the beginning about wearing four. And then when someone says, "Why are you wearing four poppies?" you can respond by saying, "Why aren't you wearing four poppies, you yeah, traitor?" Yeah. I mean, that kind of weird. Uh, mm. provocation as it were yeah it, 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 it's pe people remember in their own way and, and a poppy is one way of remembering and, and, and it, it's being made to be something that you should have or you're not seen to be respectful to to the people who died in in all these wars um and and for something but like it comes from the, people who who are generally not exactly overburdened with 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 compassion for their fellow humans the specific rhetoric you describe com comes from people who are normally telling their fans and followers to 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 hate on you know refugees or single mothers or who are the people who 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 imbue the poppy with a, a incredible reverence and importance don't generally seem to be the most humanitarian members of our society. Well, that's the dichotomy of it all, yes, yes. because a lot of the people who shout the loudest about not wearing a poppy are people who probably hold up some of the, the lowest values in, in society. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and on your point about the why are they targeting poppy sellers? It, it, no, it why are the right-wing media targeting poppy yeah, sellers? Because at the moment, the nobody headline. else is. Yeah, well, it gets that headline that, that people will look at and get angry about and say, oh, they're not poppy sellers are afraid of Palestinian marches. Oh, I'm, I'm, but, you know, it plays into that rhetoric of this is a bad thing that's happening and look how it's affecting something that is so so fundamental and, to, to our Britishness. So, actually, cleverly, you've you've brought it into the, the context of the broader sort of right-wing tabloid approach to everything. And mm -hmm. the question then is, well, who are they trying to make me angry with now? And the answer is people who are not protesting in railway stations most of the time, but are sometimes, and they are the reason why 
So we're getting we're getting angry with the p people yeah. who who are protesting against the war in Gaza. That's who they want yeah, us to I, be angry I, I, with. I don't think it'll be too long before you see a, a, a video of Nigel Farage asking how many people coming in on the boats are wearing poppies. You know, it's it's that kind of ridiculous situation that that they play into. I, I I don't I don't even know that that gets filed under a joke, Tony. Is it a, is it a joke or a it's, prediction? It, it, it could be both. Fifty-two percent, fifty-two joke, forty-eight percent prediction. Both. Yeah, I know it could. I know it could. Don't give him ideas. Eleven twenty-five is the time. Kevin's in Crayford. Kevin, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, yeah, um, what I think with the whole situation is you've got Suella Braverman telling us, "Oh, it's a terrible thing that these marches are going ahead." Yes. Uh, and, and you know the worries about the cenotaph. Is it then picked up by people like EDL and the Football Lads Association or Alliance, whatever they're called, uh, who then decide they're going to go and defend the cenotaph? Yes. They're going to go over and stand over by the cenotaph. The march is going to be nowhere near the cenotaph. No, of course. But because of the, the layout of central London, marchers will have to go past that way to get to where they need to get to. As soon as they're going to start seeing some placards, it's all going to kick off. Yes. And then Sue Ella Bravo is going to say, oh, look, see, I told you this was going to happen, but she's the one that's caused this to happen. This um, is a, a, a planned uh, route of action to, to demonise the, uh, the marches in the first place. And, and now the Metropolitan Police as well. And a, a frankly remarkable piece in the Times today, I don't know if you've seen it, where she displays uh, uh, almost unbelievable levels of ignorance about the history of Northern Ireland. But, of course... Yeah. It's Suella Braverman, so unfortunately the levels of ignorance are therefore completely, completely believable. And the mail yesterday was, was saying, pray that there is no riot at the Cenotaph. They're licking their yeah. lips. They, they, this lot, yeah. one, they, they appear to me, and perhaps I should put all this in quotes, like they did with the uh, allegations of the gentleman who says he was attacked at Edinburgh. We can put it all in quotes, but it appears to me that they want something to happen. So they want oh, some sort absolutely, of conflagration. Absolutely, absolutely. And what sort of problem is done by attacking the police is she's already making a scapegoat. She's already turning around and saying, well, it's not my fault. You know, I told you this was going to happen. And yet there would no, be no didn't... conflict if it wasn't for the said... fact that they'd said there's going to be a conflict. Absolutely, absolutely. It's mad, isn't it? And what role yeah. does the poppy play in this? It's a sort of, it's a support act in a way, isn't it? It's saying, oh, yeah, and, also, yeah. and also they attack poppy sellers, or they would yeah. do if we gave them half a chance. Yeah, and, and you know, that's utterly, utterly untrue. Uh, you know, there, there's very, very little, if any, evidence of any poppy sellers actually being attacked. Mm. Um, but, but it's all—it's not to frighten the poppy sellers; it's to get everybody else indignant about it. And thinking they're well, going to do but, what? But that makes the poppy sellers collateral damage. It means that these monsters yeah. aren't thinking about the feelings of the of the, uh, the the men and women, many of them military veterans, who give up their time to sell poppies in public spaces. They're sort of saying, "Oh, I don't care if they're terrorised and frightened. We're going to well, use this as an opportunity to malign the marchers and possibly even Muslims in general." Well, let's not forget, is these, these are the same people whose uh, beacon was talking about um, how it's almost their duty to buy it because of COVID and things like that. So mm. they don't care mm. for the, these elderly or the veterans or anything like that. They're happy to see them on the streets. They're happy to see them die of why, COVID. Why, why, are we, why are we shutting down just to save the lives of people that are going to die soon anyway? But, of course, yeah. the, the world turns and suddenly they're the great, great defenders of that very, very yeah. generation. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great analysis, that, actually. Thank you, Kevin. Um, mind how you go. It is 28 minutes after 11. It's a, it's a ridiculous state of affairs. The uh, uh, the way in which everybody this morning is being told that poppy sellers are under attack or poppy sellers are under threat when we can't find any evidence of it. Except, of course, and we recognise the discombobulating effect of an enormous group of people turning up in a previously quite quiet space where you are getting on with the business of selling poppies or, or, or that that would be discombobulating but it isn't a consequence of the reason for the congregation of people in the space it's a consequence of the congregation of people in the space um alex is in carmarthen alex what would you like to say uh, morning james um yeah my i think my point follows on perfectly from kevin's these people don't care about who they use or what they use as long as they're using someone to in the case of the Home Secretary, keep herself in power, and in the case of the newspapers, to, to sell copy. The, this is a completely false argument that is designed to whip up hate to drag more and more people from the far right towards what is now, when I use inverted commas, the Conservative Party, because it's not the Conservative yeah. Party I remember. Is this possibly 
a last roll of the dice because they know their centre right support is collapsing. They know that's going. It's gone, mm. and you know it's their fault. Is this is this their, another one of their ways of going? Well, let's go for reform voters. Let's go for UKIP voters. Let's go for National Front EDL. supporters. Exactly to shore up. Well, I don't know how much of a crossover there is between those groupings that you describe and the Conservative Party membership, of course, that does decide, uh, ultimately decides the identity of the next Tory leader. I mean, that would be a fascinating piece of wouldn't analysis. It, but, it would. Um, Certainly on the UKIP point, comparison. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit... Cup, well, actually, I was about to say I wouldn't be comfortable with the National Front or EDL comparisons, but given that we're talking about UKIP, it is in many ways much of a muchness. So I don't I think agree. many people would dispute the suggestion that the hardcore Conservative membership is now effectively UKIP. No. And some of the comments made by the Home Secretary, if you or I wrote those online... Mm. Well, if we believe the press, we'd have a knock on the door from a policeman to explain can't say. We'd be cancelled by tea time, Alex, um, wouldn't we? It, it's just shocking. It's it is shocking. shocking. It, it is absolutely shocking. Sometimes we need to tell each other that because otherwise you sort of put in the human responses to dial down the, oh, my goodness me. It's like the conversation we had in the last hour about things aren't that bad. Things aren't that bad. You've got a Home Secretary and the right-wing media trying to use poppy sellers as, a, as, as petrol to pour upon the flames of far-right fury about, you can insert whatever it is you want, and we're already just giving it a little bit of, oh, it's not that bad. Well, I was not expecting that to pop into my head. It's 11.31, and Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.34 is the time. So why is the right-wing media terrorising poppy sellers? Uh, claiming that they are not only under attack, but also not turning up to do their duties, their patriotic service. It's not a duty uh, because they're so frightened of being attacked. Hello, James. I met you in Southampton at your signing. I mentioned that. I mentioned that. I, James, mentioned that only because um, this text provides an identifying anecdote that proves it's true, lest anyone um, uh, worry about such things. Um, and they add, I'm a poppy seller. I've no idea why the gutter press are provoking things. I just hope that when I am out selling poppies this evening, without any fear, I hasten to add, I hope I have a busy night of people kindly showing their support. And there it is. So I, I should probably have asked earlier, if you are in the poppy selling community, what is going on here? Has it worked? Have, have the right wing media reports that you are under threat made you less likely to go out and sell poppies? And I, I, I guess... It would be nice to know in advance about mass protests in railway stations because that way the likelihood of getting jostled or just slightly discombobulated by the volume of noise and people could be prepared for or, or avoided. But to use that as an opportunity to terrorise poppy sellers seems to me to be pretty close to disgusting. So why do you think they are doing it? Why are the Daily Mail and the Sun and their various columnists determined to... Uh, uh, to describe a fictional fantasy universe in which poppy sellers are not turning up to sell poppies because of all the attacks that they are suffering. 11.36 is the time. And I stress again, again and again and again, railway station concourses are among the most surveilled spaces on this planet. British railway station concourses are among the most surveilled spaces on this planet. And... If an offence, particularly an assault, were to happen in one, we would all expect, quite rightly, that that footage would be readily available to the police, in this case the British Transport Police. And guess what? It is. And they've looked at it. And they've said there is no ev or insufficient evidence to mount any form of investigation. But crucially, the Assistant Chief Constable has added, there is no threat to poppy sellers. So why do some people in the British media really want poppy sellers to believe that there is? Erica is in Lambeth. I, actually, before I talk to Erica, I worry that, you know, some impressionable Muppet might now today be more likely to give grief to a poppy seller than they were yesterday. Because they sort of think, oh, that's, is that what I'm supposed to be doing? Gosh, I hate the right-wing media. They're always maligning people like me. Maybe I'm supposed to be giving grief to poppy sellers. But we can all, I think, hope not. Erica's in Lambeth. Erica, what would you like to say? I wanted to say um, that I really feel that there, this is a, an action that is trying to weaken democracy. Mm. Um, 
I I listened to I managed an hour of the Nick Ferrari show. This is not going to be something about Nick. Okay. Um, uh, but twice this morning, uh, yesterday morning and this morning, I have heard a poppy cell, uh, a, a caller who is um, very patriotic saying that the poppy represents democracy. And I think we've really got to look at what's happening 360. It's not just what's happening in our country. Well, now. hang on a minute. I'd just steer you to what is happening in our country, if I may. Why are right-wing media trying to terrorise poppy sellers is the question I'm asking, Eric. As all the others um, said, because they, uh, they want to start a big fight in London this weekend. They want so, so it makes to, people even angry. People who are already yeah. thinking of coming into yeah. town to uh, defend the cenotaph against people who are yeah. going to be marching a mile away two hours later. They, they they need to be further riled up. So now they're being told, yeah. and they they attack poppy sellers. Yes, and but they, but the problem with I mean, that is that poppy sellers might believe it as well. Yes, yes, and I, and they do. There was a poppy seller on the last show who was actually phoning to say that he had. Um, I had a great success with his pop, with the poppies, and they've raised more this year than all other. No, years. no, no. We can't but, have calls you know. like that. We need people who are terrorised. We don't want people saying everything. <laughs> everything's under control. Everything's nice and peaceful. And we're so. I imagine that there is actually a volunteer problem, Erica, with the British Legion, because of generational change, because of of, of people who served or people with yeah. close close links to the last war, to the Second World yeah. War, moving on. Um, uh, yeah. to, to, to the next world and therefore their spaces need to be filled but we need people in the Legion don't we I, I, so I now open up my phone lines to people who uh, as, as that texter who describes his work tonight doing um, poppy selling what, what, is, what is the score in the poppy selling community what, what is the score among British Legion volunteers but why do you think that right wing media is trying to terrorise you into not selling poppies that's the mad bit about this the more poppies, the better, without any kind of quasi-fascistic insistence that if you're not wearing one, then you're a wronger, or there's something wrong with you. But historically, the Legion raises money for needy veterans or for veterans in need of help. So therefore, the more money the Legion raises, the better for all concerned, the better for society, especially the members of society who claim that they want to look after our own. You'd think they'd be buying poppies in their droves. Therefore, you'd think they'd be furious that right-wing commentators were essentially terrifying poppy sellers into staying at home today instead of going out to sell poppies. 0345 973 is the number you need. Before we move on, thank you, Erica. Do you remember one of my favourite PR theories? When I think that if you've got a product that is uh, just on the back burner a bit, it's not doing the kind of business that you think it's capable of doing, then if you're clever, you come out and announce that it is going to be axed. I think it happened. Didn't it happen with Heinz salad cream? I think that's the best example. And the story started appearing that said Heinz salad cream was going to be taken off sale. It's no longer popular enough. So we're going to stop selling Heinz salad cream. And then lo and behold, not only was there an outcry against the mooted cessation of selling Heinz salad cream, but many of us actually rushed to the shops and bought some Heinz salad cream. It was almost like subliminal advertising, wasn't it? As you sat there, it's like, oh, it's ages since I've had salad cream. Salad cream's actually really nice on a salad sandwich, of all things. It's nicer than mayonnaise. You've got sort of some lettuce and some tomato, probably not onion these days if you're in a relationship. It just causes problems. A bit of lettuce, a bit of tomato, maybe a sort of thinly sliced radish. Uh, and, and salad cream. It's a delicious... So I, 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 I'm i going to go out and buy some salad cream. And then lo and behold, after the outcry and then the purchasing that followed the announcement that it was going to be axed, they decided to bow. Heinz decided to bow to public demand and announced that salad cream was no longer going to be withdrawn from sale. And we did celebrate. We did take to the streets and thank the Lord that salad cream was staying on sale. Now, I've always suspected, and I've shared this with you many, many times, I have always suspected that there was never any plan to stop selling salad cream and that it was actually a move of marketing genius. And I think we've got another one on the horizon. Do you know what it is? Do you know what it is? Have you seen the story? I can't remember whether I've shared my passion 
in this field with you. But it is, for my money, one of the absolute world-beating chocolate bars. I speak of the Caramac. Now, the Caramac is, is solid chocolate. It's not got any caramel filling in it. It's the one that's like an orangey colour. And it is, I mean, almost obscenely sweet. It's got no cocoa in it. It's condensed milk, butter and sugar and, and some mysterious flavourings, which just create this most incredible caramacky, caramelly chocolate heaven. Now, it's under threat from caramel milk, which I think is a Cadbury's product that was previously popular only in, in, in Australia. And it got imported in here a few years ago. And the caramel milk very much reaches the parts that previously only a caramac could reach. And that may well have taken a big bite out of caramacs. I had a caramac Easter egg one year, and that was one of the best Easter's ever. But so the caramel milk may well have taken a big bite out of the caramac market. And they've done what Cadbury's always do. They've done other products. So you get caramac, caramel milk buttons. And do you know, in America... I actually felt my... Did you hear me swallow then? My mouth actually watered at the thought of what I'm about to tell you. That's actually incredible. You think mouth-watering is a figure of speech. It literally just happened live on the radio. In Australia, they have a flake made out of caramel. A flake. A flake and a twirl made out of caramel. I've looked them up online. They're £2.99 in this country. So I haven't ordered one yet, but I'm tempted. A flake made out of caramel milk. So the claim is that the caramel milk success in this country, having been brought over from Australia, has done for the caramac. But I am I'm quietly confident, quietly confident, that there's going to be a bit of an outcry. The media coverage bit has already happened. The Times reports today, caramac has come to a sticky end. Nations have flags, anthems, and their defining sweets, but not even nostalgia could save Caramac, which was launched in 1959. Um, they've actually already started withdrawing bars, so perhaps my theory won't stand up to scrutiny on this occasion. Multi-packs will be on sale until the end of the year. Normally I'd say, please don't panic buy. Please don't panic buy. Think of it, but I know, fill your boots, get out there now, buy every packet you can find, because if they're taking away the Caramac, it will leave a gaping hole in the heart of this nation's confectionery legacy. But my cautious prediction to you today, or, or simply my advice to you today, is don't be enormously shocked if Nestle decide at some point subsequent to bow to what they will describe as enormous public demand and reinstate the Karamak after all. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.49 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Good to see a lot of fellow Karamak fans in the house. Let's just, let's just wait and see. Let's just wait and see on that one. Um, talked a lot over the last few weeks for fairly obvious reasons about the importance of building bridges between communities, particularly people from Jewish and Muslim backgrounds. I was incredibly struck this week. I, I, sorry to sort of um, go off topic slightly, but I, 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 one of the reasons I love my job so much is that you still take me by surprise all the time. So, so things still happen on air, even after nearly <coughs> 20 years that just make me go, so the, the, the fact that the Muslim lady on Monday who said, I, I feel at the moment that I'll never be British enough, chimed so completely with the testimony of Jewish callers today talking about intergenerational trauma, just actually just, t just, just really did affect me quite deeply and emotionally. I, just, I can't put it into words that two people who we have spent weeks casting as sworn enemies are having an identical emotional experience in the context of the current catastrophe. And, and it's why I was drawn to news this morning or, or, or information this morning telling me that the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, would be at a school in North London with a, an organisation that, that literally exists to bolster community cohesion between Jewish and Muslim students. Um, What's going on, Sadiq Khan? Uh, good morning, uh, James. Uh, so, so for, for, for a few years now, we've been funding 
this great organisation, the Cabbie GB, who work with Community Security Trust. That's Maccabi, uh, M-A-C-C-A-B-I, new word GB, for, for people who correct. might want to look it up and find out more. Please do. Uh, and also Community, Community Security Trust and Tell Mama. And what we do is we go inside schools and we use our educators, community organisations, to work with young people, giving them the tools, the knowledge, the confidence to, you know, challenge stereotypes, uh, challenge generalizations, and to, frankly speaking, you know, understand, it sounds cliche, it sounds corny, but it's true. There is so much in common Jewish people have and Muslim people have, and if they understood more about their history, about, you know, some of the things we have in common, it means when, when there are tensions in the Middle East, as there have been for the last four or five weeks, it doesn't lead to, uh, you know, anti-Semitism, it doesn't lead to Islamophobia, and these tools, these skills are life skills, and we're hoping this new generation of Londoners will do far better, frankly speaking, than our generation. Are you optimistic? I'm very hopeful. This it, is even at times like this, when entrenchment becomes a perfectly understandable resort? Well, it's difficult. It's difficult. I mean, some of these young people I've spent time with this morning may have you know, read the Times today, uh, may have been listening to what some politicians have been saying over the last few uh, weeks. Well, don't, don't, you don't mince words on this programme. Um, you're talking about Suella Braverman essentially having a swing at Mark Rowley, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. Well, it's more than that. It's more than that. It's more than that. So, so, so these young people I spent time with today that we, that we are trying to you know, teach uh, that we've got more in common, we should bring people together. They're hearing uh, a Home Secretary reinforcing stereotypes and generalisations mm -hmm. when it comes to hate marches. They may be led to believe, actually, one of the quintessentially British ways to express your views, aka protesting, is not to be uh, encouraged. And that's why it's incredibly important for us to rebut mm. the sort of stuff that she is saying, because actually, you know, inaccurate, irresponsible, inflammatory behaviour from senior politicians is not the way to address people's concerns. We're going to be addressing people's concerns, these young people concerns, some Jewish, some Muslim, rather than playing on them. And what I fear is there is you know in our politics in the mainstream of our dna politics a, a temptation to play on people's fears all the time and it's so infuriating because you've got young people here who have been inspired by hearing about other people's religions other people's cultures and you know want to want to respect other people want to treat them fairly and understand you know if you're mm. a jewish london you've got no say at all in what the idf is doing if you're a Muslim Londoner, you've got no say at all in what Hamas is uh, doing. So you shouldn't be on the receiving end of anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. And how, how do you know that it's working? How, what, 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 what are the fruits of this work that are actually yeah, immediately or quickly visible? No. Well, so what we do is we, we um, the group we work with, Maccabi GB and other groups we work with, they, they assess the young people in advance of uh, the courses beginning, the workshops beginning, what their views are. Uh, what they think about certain things, then they they do it again after the workshops, and we're we're going to go back again and again to the school. So you can you can you know in, 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 it sounds crude, but it's not monitor people's views, their prejudices, how they've changed mm. as a consequence of the, the the workshop and stuff. And let's not forget, look, the word the word prejudice when you break it down, as I've been reminded this morning by these great educators, is prejudging, right? You yeah. prejudge often based upon ignorance. You may have read a newspaper article, you may have heard something on the radio. Uh, and then what happens is you actually are taught and explained the reality and that that myth is bust your prejudice it's gone. is yeah. you know your educators you're not ignorant and that's what we're trying to do bust those myths uh, why do you think she's doing it oh listen it's naked political ambition is it and what this naked what this naked political ambition is doing it's not simply you know you know thrown to the gutter at one of the great offices of state the home secretary but Stoke and Division. So, in fact, this Saturday, I, I, I fear and I suspect the concerns the police will have may not be from the, you know, pro-Palestinian protesters, I hope, mm. uh, not from them, but actually we now know the EDL are going to rock up on Saturday, on Armistice uh, Saturday. The far right are organising to turn encouraging hatred and anti-Muslim uh, uh, rhetoric. So, look, uh, there are consequences of her actions. And what, what one thing is, that we've is, got to... Are you, are you, is she a danger to public safety, then, in that context? Well, when, you, when you're making superiorizations, when you're playing on stereotypes, when you're stoking division, it poses a challenge. But also when you're the Home Secretary with a massive, massive uh, platform. And, you know, but the, 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 the really, the, really the, the important point that I'm not sure people appreciate is there are two you know, foundational principles in our country. One 
is uh, the operational independence of the police. Really important. Just think about the consequence. If I or the Home Sec or the Prime Minister can tell the police which protests to ban and which to allow, what's to stop me tomorrow telling them who to investigate, who to arrest, and so forth? That's really important. But the second really important point, and I lived through the noughties, you know, uh, the mm. 7th of July bombings, what happened after the Iraq war, without in any way, in any way excusing extremism, in any way excusing radicalization, in any way excusing terrorism, you've got to give people safe spaces to articulate an event. Hate crime is not acceptable. You know, some chants are not acceptable. Paving in a way that causes people fear is not acceptable. But actually protest, really, really important cornerstone of our democracy, is something we should be incredibly proud of. Why are you trying to ban a protest on a view that people feel really strongly about? Why hasn't Rishi Sunak fired her? Well, it's quite clear. There's one, one of two explanations. Uh, you know, either he's so weak uh, that he's too uh, scared to frighten her because what it may lead to, or he believes her views. And here's the really interesting thing. I've just heard in the last, you know, half an hour before I arrived at this mm. uh, school, um, that apparently her article was shared with number 10. They made changes, some of which were accepted, some weren't. I'm curious about two things. Mm. One is, what did the original article say from Home Secretary? Uh, that, that the Prime Minister's team uh, changed. But secondly, which of his suggestions did she reject and which did, he, did which did she accept? I mean, the Prime Minister, if he can't influence his Home Secretary to, you know, change her article, it shows how impotent and how weak he is. Just, just in conclusion, if she hadn't made the interventions she has made, you're pretty clear that the planned congregations of various far-right and fascistic individuals and organisations this weekend would not be occurring. They said so. I mean, I mean, when you listen to what they're saying in the media, when you see what they're writing on social media, they are responding to the Home Secretary characterising the protests as uh, hate marches. They're responding to her talking about the importance of Armistice uh, uh, Day. By the way, Armistice Day last year, there was a protest organised by those concerned about COP27. Mm. Uh, so this idea that nothing happens on Armistice Day is simply incorrect. And many people go to football matches and, and so forth. The key thing which the organisers have agreed with the police is they're going to stay well away from the cenotaph. There are restrictions applied to uh, uh, at the march. If they breach those restrictions, the police will take uh, mm. action. I'm hoping... Uh, there are no issues. But if there are, the police will make arrests. If anybody tries to incite hatred uh, or behaves in a way that's unlawful, the police will take action. But what we now know is happening is in addition to the, uh, inverted commas, pro-Palestinian march, there's now going to be, inverted commas, the far right uh, yes. marching uh, in, in London. And by the way, in their words, protecting the cenotaph. <laughs> now, the reason we're talking about that is because of the Home Second, the Prime Minister. Yes. Um, let's just end with... Uh, more harmonious and optimistic stuff. The, these organisations uh, come from the Jewish and the Muslim communities, don't they? So Maccabi GP is an Anglo-Jewish charity. Tel Mama is uh, is an Islamic charity, and the, and the Community Security Trust uh, looks after Jewish in, uh, Jewish interests as well. Th this is the sort of work that my great friends at the Anne Frank Trust do as well, isn't it? Going into schools and trying to nip prejudice in the bud. Uh, that is probably the best time to nip it, isn't it? Absolutely. Listen, in these dark times, honestly, James, in these dark times, just remember there are some brilliant, brilliant Londoners, mm. brilliant people around the country from different backgrounds, you know, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, members of an organised faith. Heathen. Aren't. Don't forget the heathens. Uh, I said members of, the, <laughs> members of organised faith and those that aren't members of an organised faith. Yeah. doing wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, things. And, and that's what you'd be wanting, surely, your Home Secretary, your Prime Minister, to be amplifying and promoting, yes. talking about the best of us, rather than, you know, amplifying the worst. Sadiq Khan, Mayor of London, speaking to us from a, a North London school where stand-up education against discrimination is underway, a project de delivered by a variety of charitable organisations essentially uh, dedicated to countering hate and, crucially, uh, more than ever indeed at this time, uh, a, a congregation of Jewish and Muslim facilitators in, in school classrooms to create a safe space for young people to explore and learn together about issues of discrimination, racism and extremism. And as the Mayor of London just, uh, uh, well, pretty clearly attested that it, that is something that assumes an even more urgent need in the context of comments now being made utterly flagrantly and publicly by the actual Home Secretary. Guess what? 
Do you know, I am so busy this week with the book tour. I actually just had to check what day it was. It's Thursday, right? So it's Scotland tomorrow, Norwich last night. No, it's Thursday, so it must be Mystery Hour. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Oh, is it that time already? Five, five after 12, and how welcome indeed it is. Um... This is your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on your radio dial. If you haven't listened to it before, just sit tight, all right? You're in for a bit of a treat. If you have, you kind of know the score, so I sometimes wonder what point there is behind me explaining roughly what the rules are. It's You, you ring in with a question, or someone rings in with a question. It could be something silly, it could be something deadly serious. It could be uh, scientific, historic. Uh, I don't really like questions about cars. But that's it, really. That's, and even then, sometimes they can be quite good. And then someone else rings in with the answer. And that doesn't sound particularly promising, does it? But this has now been running as a regular radio feature. It must be close to becoming, apart from Ken blinking Bruce, it must be close to becoming one of the most long-running features on British radio. Uh, indeed, it's even spawned its own board game, would you believe? And what's more, you can win one! By making the most uh, popular contribution, well, I say popular, by making my favourite contribution of the week. Whether question or answer, if your contribution to this week's Mystery Hour is my favourite by one o'clock today, then you will be sent a brand spanking new Mystery Hour board game just in time for Christmas. I've signed a few this week. I'm not sure, but I use a Sharpie when I'm doing signings. And sometimes in the queue of people waiting to get a copy of How They Broke Britain signed, have I told you the good news about How They Broke Britain? I don't think I have, have I? Didn't I? I gonna, if I tell you this, I might get emotional because it is actually dedicated to my late father, and and that puts a whole different dimension on things. But this weekend in the Sunday Times, my new book will be at number four, which is thanks entirely to you. <laughs> well, I wrote it, didn't I? But if you bought it, then I don't think I'll ever be able to thank you enough. The only people who've sold more books in the United Kingdom than me this week are Arnold Schwarzenegger, Britney Spears, and Billy Connolly which for a politics book is absolutely unheard of. And that's why I'm glad you can't see me at the moment because I might just be tearing up a little bit. But when people are bringing me copies of the book to sign, a few people have brought the board game. And I'm 99% certain that as soon as they've gone away from the desk, it's smudging all over the place because it's a really glossy box, isn't it? It's a really glossy box. And Sharpies dry quite quickly, but I, I am very, very worried that there are smudged Mystery Hour boxes all over the place. Anyway, if you want to get yourself one, either for Christmas or for someone you really, really love, or just for yourself, because you, you deserve it, then you can go to mysteryhour.co.uk. mysteryhour.co.uk, and you'll find it there. It's also available in, in, in an increasing number of shops, but mysteryhour.co.uk is guaranteed to... Be with you shortly. Uh, terms and conditions are at the website for the competition. If you want to be in with a chance of winning it, go and check the terms and conditions. Well, no, you've got a chance of winning it whether you check the terms and conditions or not. But if you're weird like that, then lbc.co.uk contains the terms and conditions. Mysteryhour.co.uk contains the game itself. Eight minutes after 12 is the time. Just before we crack on, I've been reading out critical e- texts and emails a bit more than usual today because I think in the context of Israel and Gaza, it's very important for me to stress and remind you that whatever I say, two different people will hear two completely different things, both convinced that I'm entirely siding with the other person. Uh, So I'll read out this one as well, although I read it with a heavy heart. After years of listening to your brilliant show, sadly we must now part ways, as I am unable to listen to anything espoused by a devotee of the most disgusting chocolate bar in the world, Caramac. So farewell, James. It was lovely listening to you, but it's now glaringly apparent that you are a psychopath. The most disappointed Dan in Burnley. Oh, how do you know you're the most disappointed Dan in Burnley? There might be another Dan in Burnley whose wife left him this morning. How can you... You can't be the most disappointed... Well, anyway, I'm sorry, Dan, but, you know, I I speak as I find. If you can't take it, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen, you snowflake. Nine minutes after 12, and this Dan is not in Burnley. He's in Huddersfield. Question or answer? Question, James. Carry on, Dan. Uh, my question is, why don't orchestras just learn the song? <laughs> why do they always have to read from the sheet of music? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the, cause the, the soloist has learned mm. it, I think. I'm just trying to... The last concert I yeah, went to cool. was, in, was in Manchester, and the soloist doesn't have sheet music in front of them. But no, the, I mean, but the I'm, orchestra I'm does. A, 
I've not seen many orchestras in person, but every time you see them on the TV, they've always got the sheet in front of them. Uh, when you go see a band live, they don't have, you know, the... No, the but they've got a much bigger repertoire. They've got a much bigger repertoire, orchestras. You come in, it's like a, it's a two-hour piece of music. How many of them can you keep in your head at the same time? <laughs> Are they going in blind? Do they not know what they're going to be playing before, or is it just a big surprise for them? I'm not... <laughs> they're definitely not going in blind. <laughs> well, because you rehearse well, with the conductor a lot, and we've had a question about the difference that a conductor can make, and it was actually one of my favourite questions and answers yeah, in, 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 in a while. It was really good, but you'd think that they all knew it. It might... Mu- I like that question. I, I mean, it might be that we both end up looking a bit daft, but at the moment, I like yes. that question. Why don't members of the orchestra, why don't they know the bloody music, Dan? <laughs> instead of, instead of having sheet, sheet music in front of them, you're on orchestras and Dan. I've even been writing it down with my Sharpie. Thank you, mate. It is 10 minutes after 12, and Fergus is in Dundee. Question or answer, Fergus? Hi, James. It's a question, please. Carry on. Um, the question is, what happens in our brain when we get over a certain fear? So I was deathly afraid of spiders for a long time. Yes. Moved in with my partner. She's really afraid of spiders. And I just one day kind of dealt with it. And yes. now I'm not scared of them anymore. Well, I and mean, I think it, it, it's called exposure therapy in, in treatment, I think. So yeah. you, you took it upon yourself by dint of being so manly that <laughs> you would deal with the spiders, even though you were probably at least as scared as your girlfriend. Yeah, well, I mean, to tell you a very short story, when I first moved into this flat, I was, my kitchen had like a corner with a couch, and I got trapped in the corner by a spider, and I managed to drop a textbook on him. I feel bad about it now, because oh, I don't like enough. killing them. Yeah. Uh, drop a textbook on him, and then put another three or four textbooks on it. It's that bad, you were that scared, you were that scared. Yeah, yeah, wow. and then she came around the next day, found four textbooks with a stool upturned on top of it, with a note that said, danger, spider underneath. This was you uh, doing this? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was your uh, mum that came can... round and found that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's quite sweet. <laughs> and did your <laughs> mum dispose of the, your mum got rid of the spider for you? Did she? Well, it was very dead by that point. But yeah, yeah she must have. Yeah. Um, and now, yeah. How, I mean, now yeah. what? You just—it's like da 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 spider I'll rescue. Just, yeah, put him in a cup, bring him outside. No problem. I yeah. do you know what, Fergus? I'm the same with mice. Really? Yeah, little ones. I don't think I could do it with a rat yet. I used to be massively phobic about rats, and I'm not anymore. If I see a rat scurry across the towpath, I don't jump eight feet in the air. I don't like it. I wouldn't keep one as a pet. But we've got three cats and building work, which, you know, can disrupt things. And Mm -hmm. and, and so they've been bringing mice in a little bit, like one or two a month maximum. Mm. And I would once, uh, we'd have argued furiously about whose job it was to get rid of the mouse. But now I'm pretty chill about it. So the same thing has happened to me. And I think it is just that sense of, well, if I don't do it, who will? Which only really happened to you after you moved in with your partner. Yeah. And we've got we've got four cats and they just play with the spiders. They don't even they don't even kill them. They just toy with them. Um, Yeah. We're coming to see you tomorrow, by the way. Oh, oh, are you? I can't wait. Which one is it? Is it Edinburgh tomorrow or St. Andrews? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. I'll see you there then. Nice one. And 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 I'm over a CD of my old band if that's not inappropriate. Yeah, it'd be wonderful. I'd love it. Thank you, man. I'll see you tomorrow night. Uh, What is the reason? How do you overcome what feels like a genuine phobia without any treatment? Is it just exposure? Is it? Is there a word for it? Does it happen because you've had to, or does it happen because you just sort of it, it wears out, it tires? Thank you, Fergus. It is twelve thirteen, and David is in Wembley. David, question or answer? Question, please, James. Yeah. Um, this, sorry, it's the first time crying. I'm a bit nervous. It's only um, me. So, <laughs> so basically, I was going to call last week, but I didn't get the chance. But um, I had a really great dream, like a week or two ago. This is and, this is top radio already. Go on. <laughs> and my question is, why is it so hard to remember dreams after you've just had them? Because mm. I was, it was a good dream, and even as I woke up, I was trying to hold on to it. I didn't keep a pen and paper, you know, as some people say. But it's like, even as you're trying to remember it, it's already going. It's a weird one, but yeah. Well, you're not conscious when you have it is going to be part of the answer, isn't it, in some way? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, 
sometimes you can remember bits of them. But I think why are dreams so hard to remember is a, is actually a really good question. I can't believe we've never had it before. Which, to be honest, well, maybe me- why um, some some dreams are easier to remember than others. Maybe it's something like well, that. that. That's probably to do with the circumstances in which you woke up, whether whether mm. you were sort of dragged out of REM sleep or whether you'd come to the end of a sleep cycle. If you come to the end of a sleep cycle, I imagine they're lost forever. But um, if, you, if you're dragged out of it mid-dream, then it's going to be fresher. I, why am I talking, David? <laughs> I have no idea. No idea at all. I put it on the list. Why are dreams so hard to remember? How come? We, and what, what, is, what is happening when we overcome a deep and visceral or atavistic fear? And why don't orchestra members know the flipping music? Why do they need sheet music? Seriously, it's not as if Keith Richards turns up on stage with the Rolling Stones just leafing through the songbook before he w- w- launches into I Can't Get No Satisfaction, is it? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 18 minutes after 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we are puzzled at the moment, mystified even by the reason why members of orchestras don't know the flipping music. How people like Fergus and me have managed to very bravely and uh, 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 courageously overcome very deep and, and atavistic fears, in my case of, of mice and rats, in his case of spiders. And David wants to know why we find it so hard to remember our dreams. Richard is in Tunbridge Wells. Richard, question or answer? I can answer the sheet music. Good man. You, if you wish. Yes, please. Um, in an orchestra, in, you're one of many. You don't really do very much. Yes. In terms of a, if it's a two hour performance, you're not playing for two hours unless you are the virtuoso uh, violinist. Especially, not. especially if you're on the kettle drums. Or on the piano, which oh, is yes. which is where my qualification comes from. That's here. where you come but in. But you, you do need to know where everybody else is. Oh. Uh... So it's almost like when you used to, in English class, everybody in the... Everybody in the lesson had to read out a certain paragraph. Yeah. Right. You might know the exact paragraph. You might know it off by heart. And every one of those musicians will know their bit off by heart. Yeah. But you need to know when to come in. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. Oh, that's, I mean, it's again, I, I think it, it doesn't undermine the quality of the question because it is. It's, it's, oh, it's it, a great question. It is a great if question. You're from the but it is. Looking in, yeah, yeah, exactly that. But now you've explained it, it's blooming obvious, isn't it? So you're sitting there for a two-hour piece of music and you're only coming in for the last ten minutes. How the hell are you going to know exactly where to come in just from listening with your eyes closed? There's an apocryphal, possibly apocryphal story that I was told when I was younger about tuba players in orchestras who have, you know, four bars right at the start, four bars right at the end, but would just, you know, walk off to the actual bar yeah. to get a drink, but always counting in their heads because they know <laughs> the music well enough, and then walk back in for right the <laughs> summation of it. Bum, and bum, they bum. could do that because they were talented musicians. Oh, yeah, everybody is basically just keeping up the pace as to where the piece of music is. That's brilliant. Uh, qualifications? Uh, was Young Musician of the Year three times? Well, was on Young Musician of the Year, BBC Young Musician of the Year three times when I was much younger. Were you? Uh, yeah. Well um, done, man. I, I was, I was a, a, a prodigy. What, what, what do you call a prodigy when they grow up? Uh, uh, they call them failed. <laughs> no, you're not failed. You're, just, you're a former prodigy, but you, do you still former play? Prodigy. Do you still okay, play we'll professionally? Uh, oh, goodness, no. no, no. Oh, really? Um, uh, my hands never got big enough. Was you it that simple? Was it really that simple? Uh, pretty much, yeah. To be it an absolute, to be a Premier League virtuoso, you would need to have bigger hands. If you think about the small differences that can make it between, you yeah. know, you've got a really good team of 11-year-old yes. footballers. Yes, I was exactly thinking of sport, actually. The ones that can make it just by being an inch taller or an yeah. inch shorter. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things. You sound I pretty still, sanguine. Still, you sound sanguine about it. You sound pretty chill. Oh, it's one of those things. It is. I, I still enjoy it um, personally. But, oh, that's nice yeah. to know. Well, I'll give you a round of applause, Richard. Oh, well, there we go. Hey, Thank you. Lovely stuff. I hope you don't feel I'm rubbing in the smallness of your hands by playing out that... that, that, oh, that, that, well, that. now that you've mentioned it, I probably <laughs> do, but, you know, I'll let it slide. <laughs> what a lovely answer. What a lovely bloke. Thank you, mate. Chris is uh, in Manchester. Chris, question or answer? Hi, James. It's a question. Go on. Um, <clears throat> so when you put a bottle of water or 
anything of water in a freezer and freeze it, yeah. why, why does the water expand rather than contract? Why would it contract? Uh, well, because anything that... When you cool things down, they get smaller, don't they? Yeah. So your wood, you, you know, when it's warm, you, your door expands. It is, it is unusual. It, water is unusual like this. Yeah, Not, so yes, why, I see what you why mean. Does, why does water act different to everything else that we know of? Like mercury, we're using a, a thermometer because yes. it expands and contracts. Why doesn't water follow the same rules? I think that I know this, but it is entirely in your gift to decide whether my answer is satisfactory or not. Go on, then. I think that... So think of the space that is available for molecules, and water fills that space in liquid form, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when it freezes, it forms... It forms into what's the word I'm looking for? It for, it forms into a crystal crystal structure. The crystal structure of ice means right. that the molecules take up more space than they do when they are floating around randomly, and that is why water expands when it freezes. It's because it is turning into crystal structure crystals. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds plausible. Well, it's, it's true. It the only, okay. the, the, it's definitely true. I, and, and the only question is whether or not I could explain it, and someone else could explain it in a way that sounded completely convincing and definitive. Because they're, they're not going to add anything, I don't think, to what I've said, except more knowledge, not more understanding. So it's up okay. to you. Are you going to take that um, or not? I, I want more. I want more. I want you know. There must be like a. I can't believe it. I don't know. My, my wife. My wife told me not to phone in because you would. You would tell me that it's a stupid question. It's not a stupid question at all. Well, I hope she's listening to this. It's not a stupid question. What about um, if I bring density into it? So the ice is less dense than the water. I guess that I'd explain why the ice float, floats on water. Exactly that. Yes. So it's less dense, which means it takes up more space, even though it is the same amount of substance, if you see what I mean. Crystal lattice, does that help? Yeah. Chris, but not enough, is it? You want someone to... No, that's all right, mate. It's fine. Yeah, I just do you this. Got, for... I, 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 think, I just I do this for a living. Don't you, worry, this is fine. It's just my you, show. I invented it. I invented it as a board game. I came up with it myself. I've presented it for twenty years. I've been. I've, I, th I mean, I, I thought I was quite good, but you, you're fine. You hang in there. Wait for someone else, Chris. Don't mind me. I'd give yourself a round of applause. You give yourself a round game. of applause. You patronising git. Honestly, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're on. Why, why, why does water expand when it freezes? And the uh, answer has to be better than mine. Thank you, Chris. Annie is in Sutton. Annie, question or answer? A question, please, James. Thank you. Yeah. Where should you keep your toothbrush? In your toothbrush pot. In the bathroom? Yeah. But I watched an advert the other day. Oh, no. About those things you stick in the toilet to keep it nice and clean and run blue stuff into it. Yeah, some people think that's quite vulgar. But it also, the advert says it stops poo particles flying mm. around the bathroom. My first band was called the Poo Particles. <laughs> <laughs> To be polite. So if two yeah. particles are flying around the bathroom and your toothbrush is there, yeah, are you not cleaning your teeth with toothpaste? Yeah, I and mean, you could put the lid of the toilet down. Well, I hadn't thought of that. So it's just Keith said that, so don't feel <laughs> don't feel bad. I um, feel bad now, but well, I've started keeping it in my bedroom at the moment because yeah. it bothered me so much. Yeah, I can see sure why. Once it's well, well, once it's in your head. It's going to be hard to get out again, isn't it? And and you flush it, it's and really the part me. particles and I thought fly you into might the be able air. To it. Well, I mean, what? I, I mean, yes, is the short answer. I think I think that the, the probably the physics of it, the description is correct. That when you if you flush the toilet after a number two, then number two particles are going to be floating into the air, but I not at a, not at a level that I think is problematic. If that makes sense. Oh, so it's only micro. 
Yeah, well, that particles. You're cleaning your teeth with. Particles. It's, I mean, you know, if you were coming down regularly with E. coli or, or, or uh, Clostridium difficile or something like that, then you would, <laughs> then then you'd probably want to make some, take some evasive action. But I don't think that there is. Do but you have you got have the, you got a bathroom the, cabinet, Annie? Why well, don't put it in there? Well, I it makes more it sense than your bedroom. What? I just have it by the side of the sink, and, yes. I, and so do loads of people. But you know, maybe it's the cleanest place in the house. I don't, well, it won't be the cleanest. Well, it might be the cleanest place in the house. That's what they say, isn't it? Because it's the place that gets cleaned mo- most often. So, what is your question? Is it is it dangerous? Where sh- where's the best place to keep your toothbrush? Yeah. All right, then I'm putting that on the list. I like that. Where is the best <laughs> place to keep your toothbrush? Someone's written. My dad keeps his in the kitchen. That's Matt. That's from Marion. Wow. Why does he keep it in the kitchen? I just thought that was it could get all oniony, couldn't it? Well, I wouldn't be so sure about that. I'm but sure you know, the bathroom, it. the bedroom is where it is at the moment, and I'm not sure whether that's a good idea either. No, I hear you. Um, you're on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, wh- where is the safest, most sanitary place? To keep your toothbrush. Thank you, Annie. Uh, 28 minutes after 12. I was just thinking, Chris Evans hasn't rung in for ages, has he? He used to ring in. What name did he use when he rang in? I can't remember. Was it Ivor? Ivor? What, what did he call himself? Milo in Marlowe. Was it Milo in Marlowe? He'd be, I was just thinking of don't forget your toothbrush. I was trying to come up with a joke, but there wasn't one really. But he hasn't rung in for ages. Uh, 28 minutes after 12 is the time. Dane is in Stoke-on-Trent. Dane, question or answer? Answer, please, James. Carry on, mate. It's uh, why water, uh, it's why ice expands when cooled rather than contracting. Yes. So because uh, hydrogen has a magnetic charge, uh, water molecules have a rigid shape to them. And when they're in liquid form as a fluid, they kind of flow around against each other. If you think like a ball pit. Yes, um, like it, like it, a ball pit, yeah. Yeah. Um, And then once it starts to freeze, they start to form a rigid structure almost like the carbon atoms in a diamond crystals that, yeah like crystals and yeah. that all that creates that actually creates more space between them than when they're in their fluid form because they have to fit together they have to fit in they have to fit they have to fit that's the word i'm looking yeah. for and because also, they don't fit if it, if it's freezing in a little crack in the road the road will crack i mean the force exactly. of the freezing is 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 immense yeah exactly it's it's why um it's why water at the bottom of the ocean doesn't freeze, even though it's extremely cold down there. There is so much water pressure, pressure. on top of it, they physically can't wow. move into that crystal form. Water is most dense, um, at sea level at least, water is most dense at four degrees Celsius. Qualifications, please. Because if that, I tell uh, you what, if that doesn't satisfy, who was it? I didn't write him down. That was a bit of a mistake. Chris, in, if that didn't satisfy Chris in Manchester, then nothing will. So I'm uh, education staff in the natural history department of my local museum, currently studying for my degree with the Open University. Boom. Thank you very much. Thank you very it. much, and good luck with your studies. It's half past 12. Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.34 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, Florence says, tell your caller to use a toothbrush cover for her toothbrush. Uh, I've, I've, I've got to apologise. A lot of people have been put off their lunch by that question. Um, we probably should have seen that coming, Annie, but I'm not, I don't think that we are in any position to start censoring ourselves. So I will reveal that, in fact, actually the, um, the phenomenon to which Annie referred by using the slightly delicate language of poo particles is, I think, officially known as a faecal fountain. Did you know that? A faecal fountain. Myself, I'd always prefer (laughs) Sherbet. Danny's in Saffron Walden. Danny, question or answer? It's a question, James. Carry on, mate. It's a a serious question, and uh, it's frustrated me for for decades. Yeah. You being a master of the English language, well, let's not get carried away. Let's not get carried away here. Well, one of the most articulate people I've ever listened to, to be quite honest. But anyway, that's uh, that, that, that's a by the by. The letter H is spelt A I T C H. Yes. Why do so many people say H? Yes. How Why? how strident are you in your critique of people who transgress in this way generally speaking 
I, I think this is probably one of the very few things that you know frustrates me. And even but do you news, do you correct it? Will you always correct I, it? When, 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 whenever I hear anybody says H, I always correct them. You wouldn't correct your boss. I would. Would you really? Have you got a boss? Have you got a boss? Uh, sort of, yeah. You haven't, have sort you? Of, you haven't got a of. boss, have you? You're self-employed. Well, I, but I am self-employed. Yeah, so I, you are your own I, boss. I, so when I said, would you correct your boss, you thought, well, ha-ha, I've got him here because I am my own boss and I would correct myself, but I would never say H anyway. So this is a completely well, mythical counterfactual. <laughs> well, <laughs> Stick I, that I'll in your pipe. I'll correct my wife. She's the boss. It's my wife. And you correct her. Fecal plume, apparently, not fecal fountain. She'd never say... She, She's never said. She's never said hate. Hate. Where does it come from? Hate. Hate. So, wh- well, you know, know where it comes why? from. Where people just presume that the letter H begins with the letter H, which is pronounced H. Huh, or go H. Well, why don't people say Seth or Nen? Yeah, that's a valid question. That's a valid question. It's a very valid question. I know why it's a very valid question. On the, can't we just go on the news and somebody just actually? Say once and for all, I hate it. People Stop. here do it, and they're professional broadcasters. I know it's exactly. Just, just hate it, mate. Or I rather, knew, I, I hate it. Agree with me. I, well, I just, I just want it goes agree. right under my skin. That one. That and actually, it's, it's not incorrect to say schedule instead of schedule. It's just a bit of an Americanism, but that winds me up a bit as well. Maybe the maybe yeah. this is yeah. Danny. Danny, maybe this is a an us problem rather than a them problem. I mean, why does it matter well, ultimately? I, well, I've got it off my chest. I mean, I don't know how many listeners you, you have. Maybe sort of two or three billion. I don't know. It's roughly but at that, least yeah, on a Thursday. Vo- I've, 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 at least I've voiced it now rather than just to individual people. You're no longer alone. It's why do H. they do it? It's so why H. do they do it? And I like the point you make. You don't, we don't even say Zez for Z. The Americans say Z possibly for similar reasons. Oh, we say Z, don't we? Z. Zez, Z, yeah. S, S is the better than Z. Sess. We don't say Sess. We don't say Nem. Sess. We don't say Sess. Mem. No. No. No, exactly. Right, you're wrong. All right, why do we do it? Where does it come from? H, why H instead of H? Some people listening to this will be utterly nonplussed as to what we're talking about because they've always said H and they had no idea they were not supposed to say H and they've never looked up the letter H in the dictionary. Andrew's in Epping. Andrew, question or answer? Well, first of all, thank you, Danny, because that's been driving me mad for years as well. Do you hate that Um, as well? Oh, mate, honestly, so so annoying. Anyway, yeah. (laughs) Don't start me off with it, please, Danny. You don't talk about that. Go on. Um, My question is, why don't we eat turkey eggs? Yeah, I know. And especially, oh dear, especially leading up to Christmas. Yeah, I know this. I know this. I've got this. And then why? Well, because my theory is there's going to be lots of them around coming up to Christmas. So no, why? Nice why would there be lots of them around coming up to Christmas? Well, there's lots of turkeys around. Yeah, there are lots of turkeys around, but they're not necessarily reaching egg laying age. Ah. And if right, they are, okay. if they so, are, you want the t- you want the you want the eggs to hatch so that they, you can have more turkeys next year. Right. So they they all hatch. Really... There's no market for turkey eggs. There's well, only why? a market for turkeys. Why is not? Well, they're not very nice. That's what I'm going to ask next. Does anyone know what they taste like? They're, 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 they're a bit like chicken. No, I'm joking. They are <laughs> they're, you can eat them, but they're not generally used because they're just not particularly delicious and because okay. people would rather have a turkey than an egg. So quails, geese and chicken, good. Turkey, bad. Yeah, I think so. Seagull? No, it's not. It's not the. It's not the flavour. It's not the taste. No, it, it's no. it's the fact that we we have a, an, an annual glut of turkeys at Christmas, which means that you do not have a flock that is laying regularly all year round. So right. you wouldn't be able to set up any meaningful supply chains that could be consistently. Uh, okay. Because we buy chickens all year round, and we buy. Egg, chicken eggs all year round, but we don't buy turkeys all year round. Okay, Therefore, but- we can't buy turkey eggs all year round because they are well. They're just going to be horribly skewed, aren't they? You're going to get loads in 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 two months of the year and none for the other ten. Yeah, but the question is. I suppose, why do we never eat them? As, so therefore they are the well, chicken eggs. That, is, that, if you'd forgive me, is a chicken and egg question. Because <laughs> we never eat them because you can't buy them. 
Right, okay, yeah, fair enough, you got me there. So what came first? The inability to buy a turkey egg or the failure to eat a turkey egg? Exactly. Now you're thinking on the right lines, aren't you? I I didn't phrase the question properly. I'm not going to award myself a round of applause for reasons that I suspect are fairly obvious, but I think that that the, 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 the crux of the answer has already been conveyed, but not the fine detail, Andrew. All right. All right. Okay. So we shall see. We shall see. All right. Oh, we're well, on. But it, no, thank you very much. But it will be linked to seasonality, I'm sure. Graham is in Southgate. Graham, question or answer? Uh, question, please. Carry on. I'm just over fifty, so I'm fifty plus. Yeah. Um, my hair, or my whatever, is my nose and hair and everything is growing yeah in my noses and everything i how many noses everything. how many noses have you got i've got two friends okay yeah. carry on <laughs> but yeah you know, why is my hair growing in my ears and noses and my eyebrows more and crisp and yeah you know, it's, more it's one of the great before. it's one of the great injustices of, yeah, you're over 50, aren't you? I am, I am over 50, but one of the great injustices is that you lose hair where you want it and you grow it where you don't. No, I'm bald. I've been bald for a while. That's not a, that's not a contradiction of what I just said. <laughs> where would you rather be growing hair, on your head or in your ears? That's rude. It's not rude at all. Oh, yeah, we, we are losing our hair from places where we want it while growing it in places where we don't. Unfortunately for you, nobody actually knows. I mean, the more testosterone you've got, then the more likely you are to have hairy ears, some people say. But there's no no one really knows why, why it carries on growing out your hair, out your nose and your ears. And okay, not... I'll have the other part of your, uh, your, your game. You will not. I'd say that, 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 that. I mean, I'll put it on the board, so I won't take a round of applause, but I think the answer is nobody knows. We shall find out. Thank you, Graham. 12.43 is the time. Vitek is in Barnet. Vitek, question or answer? It's a question. Yes. Um, I wonder what is the melody of the big band chime? It's so iconic, but it's repeated all over the, the different towns uh, with the town clocks. Uh, what's the melody of it? Is that you mean? That, that, so can you do it? Can you remember it? Yes, yes. There's only four notes there, isn't there? Da, da, yeah. da, da. Um, I'm not the musician myself, so I wonder if... Uh, I, 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 well, it is... I, I don't know if this answers your question, but it is... Um, oh, come on. Westminster... Four notes, quarters, Westminster quarters, it's called. And it is just a piece of music that was written for church bells. Not not for Big Ben necessarily, or for big bells. And uh-huh. and they've adopted it. It's one of the most popular um kind of peels. It's not even a peel, it's one of the most popular little tunes. So it is yeah. just called Westminster Quarters and it works because it is because we can both remember it, I guess. It's why it's really effective. <laughs> right. Right. So, so you, the question was, what is the melody, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, the melody is called Westminster Quarters. Okay, and, and, and there are no lyrics to it, no, no, no. Well, wait, wait, <laughs> we, we could write some now together. <laughs> okay. We could write some. Well, then, what, what, what does, does it, does it pop up in um, Oranges and Lemons? Uh, I'm do, do you know, sure. Do you know Oranges and Lemons? No. Oranges and Lemons, we take. It's a lovely old English song based upon all of the church I'm not bells. English myself, so no, well, I know, I know that. That's why I'm. That's why I'm, 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 That's why I don't feel that I'm patronising you by sharing no, this no, no, information. No, 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 but we no, sing it. We sing it as children, and it's an old children's song from probably the 18th or the 19th century that incorporates all the different tunes played by all the different bells of the prominent churches in London. So right. it's, it would say, "Oranges and lemons, dun 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 dun," says the bells of Saint. Clair- Clemens, and then oh, when okay. will you pay me? Says the bell of Old Bailey. When oh, really? I when I grow rich, they're all quarters, aren't they? They're all four notes. When oh, I man. grow rich, says the bells of Shoreditch. When oh, will man. that be? Interesting. Says it, well, yeah, you could have said that with a bit more enthusiasm. So interesting. That, that, I think that's better. Yeah, it is, isn't it? 
So it's, Thank it's, you very much. but I don't think Big Ben. I don't. The West. Dun, 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 that, did I just do? Dun, dun, when will that be? Was that the Westminster Quarters? You weren't expecting this when you rang in, were you, Vitek? No, 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 not at all. Thank you very much. No, Jim. thank you very much, and a round of applause for moi. <laughs> thank you. Take care, Vitek. Mind how you go. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.49 is the time. Uh, we've, we've not done much, have we, by way of answers? So what we still need... We've done the orchestras one. I enjoyed that. Uh, how, how can we overcome fears? Uh, like, you know, fears of... Well, phobias almost. Uh, both me and Fergus have overcome them in relatively recent years. Why can we never remember our dreams? Or why is it so hard to remember our dreams? What is the most sanitary place to keep your uh, toothbrush? Why do so many people say H? Peasants. Uh, and why why are there no turkey eggs for sale? Why is why do you not why don't we eat turkey eggs and why do why, why do we grow hair out of our ears even after we've stopped growing it on our heads? I, I can't do another question. This is getting ridiculous. We've got are you mad? Have you counted how many questions are still waiting for answers? <sighs> Steve's in Chelmsford. Question or answer? Uh, I'm so sorry. It's another question. Oh great. Go on then. <laughs> So, yeah. why is it that when you're driving, particularly on dual carriageways or motorways... Is this a motoring that, question as well? Well, not really. It's kind of like more bird-related. Oh, all right. It's an ornithology so, question. Yeah. So, um, why is it that when you're driving along a uh, dual carriageway or a motorway, birds swoop down across the road, almost yeah. playing Russian roulette with your car yeah. or, or lorry. Why Why don't they fly straight across the road? Yeah. Why is it that they choose to swoop down and then go up the other side? Looking for a tasty snack, isn't it? Are they? Yeah. Mm. Checking but it out. And then if what? they see something tasty, they'll park up on the other side of the road, wait until there's a bit of a lull in the traffic, then nip in and have a nibble. Oh, I see. What's, okay. What sort of birds are you talking about? Mainly pigeons. Mm. No, even, even, yeah. I mean, yeah. That is, they're scavengers, aren't they? So there it is. That will be it. Right, OK. All you right. say you don't yeah, sound convinced. You, much, you don't sound convinced. Well, I, I wonder why they do it when there's cars travelling along there at like 70, 80 miles an hour. Just checking. Just checking, getting ready for when there isn't. And then they can nip in and grab a little bit of hula hoop or something. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get a round of applause for this, Steve. I sense from some, your. Some of them don't make it. Well, that, there you go. They're risking their lives for a bit of hula hoop, I and mean, that actually adds yeah. to my answer. But I can't claim that. I, I can't claim any basis for it except sort of speculation. So, so it's nothing to do with them. Maybe. It might um, be. Don't ask me. Using, using, um, almost like the. Sat nav. Like a wind tunnel kind of you, thing. I so mean, we're can... using it to get up some speed, like an aerodynamics type scenario. Yeah, yeah, Could be. that kind of thing. No idea. Yeah. Let's find out. Okay. Why, why do they swoop? Do they swoop perpendicular to the road, or at right, or, or, or parallel to the road? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's per- perpendicular, I suppose. So they swoop it? across they, it. They, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. Yeah. Not, not. And then swoop across, and then just drop down low. Up it, and then. Almost hit your car, and yeah. then they, and then they whoosh, go up the they're off. Side, don't they? All right, we'll find yeah. out. Oh, yeah, nice one. It is kind okay. of a motoring question, really, but I like the way you <laughs> sort of cunningly turned it into an ornithological question. So you just about get away with it. Uh, Jackie's in Stuttgart. Jackie, question or answer? Answer, James. Carry on, Jackie. Um, to why we often don't remember our dreams, or why it's quite hard to remember our dreams. Yes. Um, the dream phase of your sleep is only about a quarter of the whole time that you spend asleep. Yep. And whether or not you remember your dreams depends very much on whether or not you wake up while you're dreaming. If you wake up while you're dreaming, you, chances are you'll remember it. Yep. Or just after you've come out of dream sleep. But yep. if, you, Otherwise... if you're in deep sleep, you, you won't remember it because it's sort of, um, your brain kind of, rinses all that off dreaming is the way that you deal with what you've done during the day or, or things that are going on in your mind and it has to sort of process and dump a lot of that yeah so if you wake up while you're dreaming then you no it's alright um, I've got it Qual- I've got it qualifications um, having a problem with nightmares and I was waking up every night with the same nightmare and I had to oh, speak no. to the doctor about it really and he, yeah. talk- he talked you through what, what was going on what, as a way of on helping you I on got medicine to stop me dreaming for about a week because I was getting really uptight about going to sleep and dreaming and that oh, was making things thing. worse and it worked so it worked it, it? yeah it worked within a few days but that's so, so, so. basically why no, no, a round of applause for Jackie 
Thank you. Great answer. Thank you. Hannah is in Hull. Question or answer? It's an answer, please, James. Yes. Can you work out which one it is from the way I introduced you? <laughs> it's uh, whether or not it's H or H. Yes. Um, and the answer is basically snobbery. Oh. Um, we, a lot of our words from Old English and words that have come over from places like France. Yeah. Um, originally wouldn't have had the H huh no. at the sound of it. So things like herb originally was herb, herb. which is how they still say it in America. And, and they do. They I say herbs. Australia. They say herbs. They are, because they were less bothered yeah. about the class system okay. than we were. So okay. I think it's the 18th century. Yeah. People suddenly got very uppity about how we sounded common yes. when we dropped our H's and T's and things like that. You know, we're saying letter instead yeah. of letter. Um, so, so the people who mispronounce it th- did so because they thought they would sound posher. Yes. So, because uh, uh, for me, saying H is the mark of, a, of an insufferable peasant, Hannah. Well, I did think that a minute ago when you just said yes. that it was people who mispronounce H as H and you said peasant. Yes. That is essentially what it is. We thought that if we dropped the H, the H, yeah. in H, we would sound posh. Oh, no, I, right. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, no, no, that, no, you've got me confused now. So, so they added the huh sound to sound less common because normally we drop an H. Normally, common people, the posh people, would think that dropping the H's sounds estuarine. So, you know, yeah. how's it going, Anna, in Ol, for example? <laughs> and then you're sticking H's. So you put they've put an extra H on something because they thought it would make them sound posh, but actually, it's made them sound the opposite of posh. Two hundred years later. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah, that. So qualifications? Words, qualifications? Uh, I'm an English teacher. Well, I, that doesn't explain how you know this. There's lots of English teachers in the world who wouldn't have a Scooby-Doo. <laughs> so when I was at university um, yes. studying English, I did a course on medieval literature. That'll do. Which Round of applause. to speak old English. Round of applause for Hannah. Well played. I like that Thank one. Thank you. I hope Danny, like Danny likes it as well. Adam's in the Forest of Dean. Adam, question or answer? It's an answer, James, Make for the turkey snappy. question. Make it snappy. Why don't we have turkey um, eggs? Because they lay only 100 eggs a year, whereas a chicken will lay 300 plus eggs a year. Um, and they're bigger birds, so it's just not as. It's not viable. I mean, because it's, to- it's not, they're not suitably, di- they're not significantly different. So if you're trying to feed a, an egg market, then you might as well yeah. use chickens. So but it's got nothing to do with amazing, Christmas. And they make the best scrambled eggs. I, they, they're very creamy turkey eggs. I, I did malign them they earlier in, in, incorrectly. You incorrectly. Did? Incorrectly. That's why I phoned up. Incorrectly. See, yeah. I'm just there showing Sue Ella Braverman how easy it is to say I was wrong. I was wrong. I made a mistake. I apologise. Um, so it's got nothing to do with Christmas? No. Okay. No. All right. Well, no, if you think oh, a turkey okay. will lay an egg every three days, whereas and, a chicken will lay an egg And you've got day. a choice of what you're going to keep in your barn. You're going to keep a chicken in your barn. Absolutely. Qualifications? Um, I have chickens and turkeys. There it is. Round of applause for, for Evan. Thank you very much. Thank you. There you go. Stephen is in... Uh, oh, come off it. Ca- cast- <laughs> Castel Halu. Castel Halu. Castel Halu? Halu? Castel Jalou. Castel Jalou. I, I did a it. Spanish on the J then. Uh, anyway, question or answer? Answer, James. Yes. It's the uh, why do uh, birds... Uh, why do birds... Da, 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 da. <laughs> Go on, what is it? Well, birds evolved before cars. <laughs> this is very tough. You can have that. That one's true. Yeah, and um, it's an evasion strategy against predators. And so not all birds do it. Some birds, like starlings, fly very direct. But pigeons, wood pigeons particularly, yeah. you'll see them do the same flight pattern whether they're crossing a road or not. Like if you're walking down a field, you'll see them do that same up uh, and then dip. And it's to evade uh, um, the, mainly things like peregrines. Well, they're like being a more moving target, really. is harder to hit. Well, it's... it's like moving moving. erratically. <laughs> moving it's erratic. moving erratically. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Whereas, uh, yeah, whereas starlings... Um, <laughs> Yeah, oh, you've got it. Qualifications? Qualifications? 
a um, member of the RSPB for many years. Well, so am I, but I didn't know that. Round of applause. Well, for, I also yeah. take an interest in well, Exactly. It's time I started paying more attention. Thank you very much. I think we've run out of time, so we didn't get some answers to some of them. Uh, oh, it was a lovely one this week. I, I feel that uh, Annie's faecal plume deserves a little bit of attention, but... Not from me. I'm going to give it to Richard the pianist because you don't need big hands to play the Mystery Hour board game. And if you don't understand that, then you weren't paying attention. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can also rewind live radio. You'll find all of LBC's shows there to catch up on, as well as the world's biggest podcasts, including Mystery Hour, as its own self-contained podcast. There's millions of them. Rewind live radio on Global Player. Download for free from your app store or just head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC. 